welcome uh, the members of the Foundation Budget Review Commission, uh, chairs, uh, um, the chairs, as well as all the other members. I also want to introduce and, and acknowledge our state representative, Peter Cocott, who's here today. And I want to personally thank him for his efforts to have this hearing held here in Northampton. So please welcome Representative Cocott. Thank you. This mic is taped down so I can't lift it up. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk like this and hope that all of you can hear me. Um, first of all, thank you all. It's a lovely Saturday. It's, it's pretty cold outside, but this is a great crowd. Um, I just wanna um, recognize and thank um, some folks who are here today. First of all, my legislative colleagues who are here, uh, Steve Kulik from Worthington and Kim Ferguson from Holden. Thank you very much. I'm gonna make a radical statement, and that is, I think there is perhaps nothing more important to, to the success of our students, our communities, and this state than the reform of this funding formula. And we are very, very fortunate in that we have two chairs of this commission that are in a unique position to not only listen to you, but to analyze all of this data and to come up with recommendations for us. Let me just briefly talk about these two folks and, and thank them again. Um, Representative Alice Peisch, graduate of Smith College. Let's give her a big hand. 1979 grad of Suffolk Law School, 2009 grad of the Kennedy School of Government, but, but perhaps more importantly, she was the Wellesley Town Clerk. She was a member of the Wellesley School Committee. She was a member of the Wellesley Finance Committee and Town Meeting. She's been a rep since 2003. And so I think she is very well qualified to listen to you all today. Senator, Senator Sonia Chang-Diaz, representing the Back Bay, Bay Village, <laughs> Beacon Hill, um, Chinatown, Dorchester, the, the Fenway, Jamaica Plain, Mattapan, Mission Hill, Roxbury, South End, where all the cool kids hang out. That's where she represents. But most importantly, she served as a public school teacher in Lynn and Boston. So once again, we are fortunate to have two great legislators chairing this committee. Thank you all for being in Northampton today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Coca. We were told that Northampton was where all the cool kids hung out. That's why we came. Um, <laughs> So uh, I'm gonna officially uh, gavel in uh, this public hearing of the Foundation Budget Review Commission. Uh, as, you, as you heard, and thank you for the very warm welcome, uh, my name is Senator Sonia Chang-Diaz. I'm the Senate Chair of the Education Committee, uh, and in that uh, role, also co-chair of this commission, which was established in the FY15 state budget. Um, before we really get underway, I also uh, want to give a return thanks to the local officials in Northampton and the administrators of Northampton High for hosting today's hearing. And want to take this moment to uh, recognize the members of the commission that are here with us at this moment. We might have a couple others trickle in and I'll try and recognize them as they arrive. But maybe let's just begin uh, stage right if I'm remembering my high school drama days. Uh, if the members can just introduce themselves. Thank you. Uh, Patrick Francomano, King Philip Regional School Committee, President, Massachusetts Association of School Committees. Timothy Sheehan, I'm on the board of directors of the Massachusetts Teachers Association. In spite of the name tag, I am not Barbara Mataloni. Um, and I teach fourth grade in Amherst. Kimberly Ferguson, first Worcester District State Representative and member of the Education Committee as well. Linda Noonan, Executive Director of the Massachusetts Business Alliance for Education. Um, I am representing the organization today. Joe Esposito, a board member, is the usual member of the committee. Commission. Tom Moreau, I'm the designee of the Commissioner of Elementary and Secondary Education. John Coleman Walsh, representing the American Federation of Teachers. John LaFleche, Superintendent of Southern Worcester County Regional Vocational School District and representative of the Massachusetts Association of Vocational Administrators. Uh, David Vertolino, 19-year business manager in Medway and currently executive director for the Mass Association of School Business Officials, MASBO. Uh, and as you heard uh, referenced earlier to my left, in case you can't read the name tag, is our um, esteemed co-chair uh, and also the house co-chair of the Education Committee, Alice Peich of Wellesley and Smith. 
college, not to be forgotten. Um, the Foundation Budget Review Commission, just to give a little background, is charged with reviewing the way that foundation budgets are calculated and with making recommendations for potential changes in those calculations. To inform its deliberations, the commission is holding six public hearings across the state in order to gather input from members of the public. In particular, the commission is seeking public testimony that addresses one or more of the topics that the commission is charged with examining, which are listed in the handout that um, hopefully has been made available to you uh, I think at the table on the way in. So we would respectfully ask that your testimony remain focused on these specific charges that are before us as a commission. Um, we also ask, as you can see, we have um, many people here today uh, and a you know, full uh, complement of folks who are signed up to testify. So we are going to ask folks that you limit your testimony to three minutes so that we will have time to hear from everyone um, during this hearing. As a reminder, written testimony is also uh, being accepted and will, uh, will definitely be reviewed, so please don't hesitate to uh, submit that to the committee. You can pro uh, provide that either to Nathaniel or to Jenny, who are our two staff members uh, of the Education Committee. And in deference um, to legislators, uh, if there are any who wish to testify, uh, and it sounds like m the, those who are here are here to listen um, and to welcome, which we thank you for, but if any other do arrive, we may take them out of order. Um, and lastly, we ask that you turn off all cell phones uh, and other devices that would make noise or disrupt the hearing. And I know I said lastly, but really lastly, I uh, just want to make sure everyone is aware that this hearing is, uh, is being video recorded today. So with that, uh, we're going to be begin the first person who has signed up to testify. Uh, and we have John Provost the nor from the Northampton Public Schools. Did you and the mayor wish to come up together, or did you want to go, go one after the other? OK. <clears throat> On behalf of the students of the Northampton Public Schools, and as their superintendent, I'd like to thank you for your commitment to this process and for the $156 million of state aid that Chapter 70 has brought to Northampton in the past two decades. At its inception, the foundation budget was closely aligned to the educational costs in Northampton. Initially, Chapter 70 provided for about a third of the actual net school spending in our city. Now, it provides for only a fifth. So what has changed? Among other things, the percentage of students with disabilities has increased. As you know, the foundation formula provides an additional funding increment for special education based on an assumed incidence of just under 5%. The actual incidence in Northampton is now over 20%. The assumption just doesn't match our reality. Inflation in the cost of health care has also eroded the adequacy of the foundation formula. Between 2006 and 2013, the cost of insurance, retirement, and employee benefits for our school employees increased $1.3 million, even though we cut our teaching force by 10%. Let me just say that again. Our costs went up $1.3 million, even though we were laying off 10% of our teaching force. The Northampton, Northampton is a GIC community. Even with all the cost efficiencies of the GIC, we still estimate our employee benefits this year to be nearly double the cost of those assumed in the formula. We're not the only community for which the formula has failed to keep pace with the actual cost of providing a public education, which is why the actual statewide net school spending exceeds the foundation amount by more than 20%. One result of the formula's inadequate cost projections has been the diversion of resources away from other areas of school spending, such as technology. You should know that Northampton High School, where you're seated right now, is the only school we have in this district that has Wi-Fi coverage. In our other buildings, we have a patchwork of wireless access points, which occasionally include unauthorized routers that teachers have brought in so that their kids can access the internet. As you look for options for adjusting the formula, I'd strongly encourage you to reconsider the assumptions in these two areas. I believe that the assumed incidence of students with disabilities should be based on historical state or national statistics instead of the current arbitrary percentage. And since the GIC is the state's strategy for bending the curve on health care costs, the formula should at least assume that communities will experience GIC-like costs at a minimum. 
Though not comprehensive, these fixes address two areas where the formula assumptions have become significantly discrepant from our reality and where adjustments could profoundly affect our ability to provide equity and excellence in education. Thank you for your consideration. Before you begin, Mayor, I just want to check if there are questions um, from any members of the commission. Seeing none, thank you again for your testimony. Mr. Mayor. Thank you again and welcome uh, to the commission. I want to begin by first wholeheartedly endorsing Dr. Provost's testimony, and I will focus my limited time instead on highlighting different concerns with the foundation budget, in particular its relationship on, on spending uh, for charter and school choice students. Northampton is proximate to five charter schools. In FY 2015, uh, 201 Northampton students have chosen to attend these charters, taking with them approximately $1.9 million after netting uh, reimbursement. The tuition calculation for these charter students is based on the foundation budget and consists of multiple components. The fact that the foundation rate for out-of-district SPED students is so dramatically undercounted in the foundation button budget and Northampton's out-of-district SPED spending is three times the, the foundation budget, it result, results in an inflated base rate being applied to charter tuition. If a more accurate foundation budget amount were used for out-of-district tuition, the charter foundation budget base rate would result in ascending tuition that more accurately represents Northampton's financial obligations. A a th sorry about that. A second component of the charter school tuition calculation is the above foundation spending rate. Many districts, including Northampton, spend more than the foundation budget requires. The charter tuition formula captures this additional spending effort by converting it into a percentage applied to the foundation base rate. In Northampton, this above foundation spending rate averages $1,900 per student or approximately $391,000 extra dollars going to charters. If the foundation budget represents adequate funding for local school districts and ultimately determines our Chapter 70 aid, then charter school tuition should be based just on that same foundation budget. We're told charter schools were created to spur educational competition and innovation. If Northampton chooses to spend above foundation budget on education, those extra funds should remain in our district so that our schools can improve, innovate, and compete in this new educational marketplace. In 2013, I took the extraordinary step of asking voters to approve a $2.5 million general operating override to preserve city services and protect our city schools from potentially devastating budget cuts. Northampton voters recognized the importance of investing in education and approved a property tax increase. Why then should a portion of that new tax revenue be transferred to out-of-town charter schools rather than staying in Northampton to strengthen our local schools as taxpayers intended? While charter schools receive these additional funds above foundation budget for every student they enroll, traditional public schools actually get less than the foundation budget amount for every student they take in through choice. The result for Northampton is two very different funding outcomes, with one formula providing approximately 12,000 for a charter school student and the other providing 5,000 for a school choice district. Because of this disparity, Northampton receives on average $6,374 per student via, via school choice, but are charged on average $9,408 for every student we send to a charter school. This is illogical, inequitable, and ultimately harmful to public schools and communities. In closing, let me reiterate that I fully support and am grateful for this commission's work in studying the foundation budget. I urge you to consider and recommend ways to update the foundation budget to better reflect the true costs of educating school children in Northampton and across Massachusetts. I also urge you to consider and recommend ways to ensure that any updated foundation budget is applied evenly and equitably to all schools and to all students. Thank you. Any questions from members of the commission? Just one, uh, do we have a copy of that testimony? Actually, I'm so glad you asked that question. Uh, Mayor, would you be willing to provide a written copy? Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, before we move on to the next person on the list to testify, I just wanna ask uh, the audience members to um, please, you know, while 
certainly appreciate your enthusiasm, and I know the mayor probably does, um, for his testimony to um, exercise restraint when it comes to applause so that we can move quickly through the list of people who are signed up to testify. Uh, next we have Julie Spencer Robinson, uh, who is with the Nor Northampton Association of School Employees. Is that right, the president? Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. My name is Julie Spencer Robinson. I'm a teacher in the Northampton Public Schools, a parent of three children educated in those schools, a doctoral student in educational policy and leadership at the University of Massachusetts, and the president of the Northampton Association of School Employees. Senator Chang Diaz and Representative Paish, I had the great pleasure of learning from each one of you last year through my participation in the Educational Policy Fellowship Program. I appreciate the trip out here that all of you have made to hear from us in Western Massachusetts, and I'm grateful <coughs> for the hard work that you have undertaken to review the foundation budget. I have been concerned by well over a decade by the impact of school choice on Northampton and other public di school districts that operate in a competitive local educational marketplace. While our city may appear to be doing fairly well by the complicated metrics that comprise the state's foundation formula, in fact, a troubling inequity is masked. More than one quarter of Northampton's school age, uh, school age student population opts out of the city's public schools, choosing to attend private schools, charter schools, other districts' public schools, or homeschooling instead. While I do appreciate the wealth of local educational options, I lament the fact that they are available only to well-resourced families who know that they exist, who can pay the tuition, and can transport their children to their schools of choice. Northampton's public schools lose the financial and political support and the engagement of hundreds of parents and our classrooms lose the intellectual enrichment that these children from socioeconomically advantaged families might provide. Neither the private schools nor the charter schools in the area are prepared to serve students with moderate or severe disabilities, which means that a disproportionately high number of them enroll in our traditional public schools. And when our budgets are cut because we're charged two and a half or three million dollars for charter school tuition, the enrichment programs are the first to go, which leads to more parents of typical students exploring their educational options. I am actually a proponent of school choice. My parents moved to Amherst so that I could attend public schools there, and that is yet another way that families who aren't poor have always been able to exercise choice. As a teacher, I bristle under a one-size-fits-all curriculum and embrace pedagogical variety. As a citizen, I appreciate that choice builds civic capacity among parents. In the process of reviewing the foundation budget, I hope you will consider building into the formula a metric for the degree of competition faced by traditional public schools in local educational marketplaces, and then provide adequate funding to districts like Northampton so that we can respond effectively to competition from private and charter schools, and we can work to expand access to choice for all families, regardless of their socio socioeconomic circumstance or the ability of their children. Thank you. Thank you. Before you go, let me just check for questions. Oh, at the very end. Oh, and just to recognize, we've been joined by Senator Pat Chalin of Somerville. Thank you. I don't. Could you explain what you would mean by a metric that would capture competition and what you would do to? How would you? Do you have any idea what that means? I do. Um, I. Our, our public schools operate in a very competitive local educational marketplace. Other public uh, school districts don't face any competition at all or very little competition. And so we are, um, we have our, uh, our schools are drained um, by the families who exit the public schools. Um, they take their resource and their well-resourced children with them, impoverishing the public schools. Um, we're doing a great job, I think, of, of educating the children who are left behind. Uh, we do uh, a great job of educating students with mild, moderate, and severe disabilities. Um, I would, we, we can't 
we can't compete to keep the families or appeal to the families who are leaving if we're cutting enrichment programs or programs for gifted and talented children. Um, and we can't offer our expertise in educating students with disabilities to our local private schools or our local, local charter schools. That's one thing I would love to see happen is for our employees to go to charter schools and to private schools and to say, we have great success in doing this. We've been working hard at it and we're good at it. It. And I think that um, private schools and charter schools would like to see a more diverse student population, socioeconomically and in terms of ability, and the traditional public schools are in a resource to offer um, what we know to them, and, and of course it can be a two-way street in terms of their, uh, their, their, their expertise in their programming. I'd like to see that happen more within our traditional public schools. And the other thing, I, I would like to um, get much more information out to families in Northampton about all of the choices that exist. Because you can go right down the road and ask folks about the charter schools that are here, and they don't know what you're talking about. They don't know that there's a Chinese immersion charter school. They don't know that there's a cooperative arts charter school. They don't know that there's a school for social justice all very close by. Get the information, or even that there's a Smith College campus school here. They don't know the campus school exists. So let them know about all the choices that exist and ideally provide transportation to those schools for all families. I, I just, I understand the point you're making. I just don't know what we would do in the foundation budget to recognize and compensate for what you're talking about. So if you have a proposal, why don't you Write it to us. All right. If, would it be possible to just say, this is the area from which your students are drawn? How many schools are in that, uh, within a, ra a certain radius of every public school district? And if we've got, uh, we send our students to 47 different schools. Um, there are other districts that don't send their students, they don't face that kind of competition. So that's what I'm picturing. I'll work on a proposal for you. Thank you. Any, any other questions from the commission? I just have one. Yes, go ahead. Um, wh what you're describing to me seems like what you're saying is that the money should follow the child wherever they go, and if they stay in the district school, the, the money stays here, and if they go to a, another school, not a private school, but a, a public school, um, the money would follow them, and that would be the amount, the same amount that the district would get. Is that what you're proposing? That's what I'm hearing from the mayor, I think. And, I, and that sounds good to me. I'm, what? Not exactly. Um, I'm, also, uh, I'm also thinking of a way that the, that there are so many different metrics in that, in that formula budget. So to say there are some districts in, Ma in Massachusetts that face far more competition um, from other educational institutions that impoverish. As a result, it impoverishes the local public schools. So let's, let's contribute more resources to those schools in those competitive districts so that they can get in the game, so that they can offer bilingual programs, so that they can offer, offer great art programs, so that they can have uh, uh, inform the community about all the choices that exist so it's not just for the middle class and upper class families, but that, uh, that working and poor families can be aware of those choices and work to access those choices, all of those things make choice available to, to all folks in a competitive marketplace. Thanks. Scanning for other questions. Thank you again for your testimony. Um, as uh, Ms. Spencer Robinson makes her way to our seat, one thing that I just want to draw out and, and further highlight for um, folks who are here today, the, and there's been some confusion about this, I think, across the board, so it would not be unique to uh, the Northampton area. The charge of the commission is, is very strictly focused on how the foundation budget calculates um, the foundation, how the formula calculates the foundation budget. That is, what is the number that is adequate and appropriate for delivering a high quality education in Massachusetts, um, as opposed to what is the fair division of who pays for what. Uh, so I just want to highlight that again, and you know, it, to the extent that people have suggestions about how we might factor in things like competition or other variables into that, you know, please do submit those ideas to us. But I just want to again underscore that that's our charge, and, and we we don't have authority to make recommendations beyond that. Um, with that said, our next person signed up to testify is Christopher Collins from the Springfield School Committee.
Good morning. Thank you all for coming, Madam Chairs and the members of the Commission. Um, you don't, I don't envy your task. Um, it's a very difficult thing that you've been asked to do to make these proposed changes. They, they obviously need it. The formula is so old that it has, education has evolved. Um, but, and this is a difficult, and it's a lot of work, and usually goes unacknowledged, and people, so we appreciate you being here and all the work that you're putting into this task. I'm sure everyone in the room does. Some of the speakers before me have highlighted some of the things that do go into the foundation budget, like the funding mechanism for charter schools and the way we get reimbursed and things like that. And other members from Springfield are gonna be here, the superintendent and our CFO, who will expand on that a little bit further. Um, so I'm gonna, when we have written testimony, so I'll stay off of that and I wanna offer something else. It's, this is the foundation budget and we still have a calendar that's agrarian in nature and we have a structure of education that's industrial in nature. And I've been on the school committee now for eight years and I've been on the finance committee for all of that time and I'm chair of it. And when we work with both Horace Mann and traditional charter schools and we look at the funding mechanisms and what they do, those inequities that have already been described hurt the, re the remainder of the students in a school system. But I want to get even more in basic than that because what, it, what I've seen and by doing that is when we look at the per pupil expense amount that we're given when we need to calculate that, you will notice that the highest per pupil spending amount is for high school level. And then it goes down from there. And this is a foundation budget and to me that's upside down because the foundation of education happens in the, at the elementary level. And we need to be doing more interventions and more spending on that level. And quite honestly, there are fewer charter schools that would affect the formula probably better for the school systems. But I think we a recommendation from this committee that we need to look at investing more younger on, and that will help with a lot of the issues that happen later on in high school uh, and middle school, the tough years. Um, but I would like to see something done in the budget to help do that so we can offer more interventions, more options at that level, and our students will, across the state will be more successful when they get into the upper levels of education. Any questions from the commission? Um, uh, Jeff, yes, go ahead. Um, I'm intrigued by the, the questioning of the elementary versus high school. Probably some data out there on what expenditures are at those levels. I know initially it's always been that the assumption was higher cost kids in the high school level. I'm assuming that was informed at, at the inception. I don't know if that's still the case. I think you're advocating that there should be an increased focus at the younger grades. I, I so am. So a policy matter, irrespective of where people are spending money, you're suggesting to increase the premium to try to expand program, is that the thrust that's, of that's exactly what I, we, we've done a lot of it in Springfield ourselves. We, we are the poorest city in the state. We're the second largest school system in New England. And we've done that and we've invested money that you kind of have to move around and rob from Peter to pay Paul at the lower level so that we have a higher level of interventions at that level. But I think it needs to be acknowledged statewide. The more we invest at that level, the fewer problems it, we're going to have at the upper level, and it really is just as expensive, if not more, to have the, le the kind of interventions necessary to make all students succeed when they get to the middle school and high school level. That cost is really a lot higher than what we currently see. Just a quick follow-up. It's an interesting point, um, so thank you for bringing it. Um, on the charter side, I think your uh, when the charter tuition formula was changed 10 years ago, it was well received precisely because it used to pay an average in the district. And by paying based on foundation, it reflects the cost at each segment, right, at each level. So in fact, tuitions did go down to charters from that part of the provision because most of them are elementary. So elementary being lower means the tuition goes out as lower. If you increase the elementary, it would increase charter payments. I, I would agree. Um, but we have significant number of charters that go all the way up through high school. Right. So for us, it, it's, it would be, about, it would be right. pretty much the same. 
Um, but I agree that that did that. But and as you bring that up, the full per pupil amount goes, and we still have lots of costs that remain that we have to pick up, as other speakers said. We still have to heat the schools. We don't close any classrooms. When you take one person out of a classroom, you still need that same teacher. You still need same all, all the other structures. So those are the issues around charter schools besides that. But I agree that the, if the average was worse, it's better now. Um, but even given that, it is more important to put money and down at the foundation of education, which is this is a foundation budget. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you again for your testimony. You. Um, as uh, I asked Pat Roach to come forward to the microphone, I, I do want to add another uh, layer of clarification in because I hear already a lot and I suspect there's going to be more um, uh, thoughts and, and analysis about charter schools uh, on this list of testifiers. While certainly it has been the case for uh, Co-Chair Peich and myself, and I know many other people at this table have participated in a very robust way in the debates over charter school policy from the past year and probably coming up again this coming session. Issues of charter school tuition payment and how those work are beyond the scope of this commission. Um, we are tasked with, with making recommendations about how to calculate what it costs to educate a child, whether they are in a charter school or a traditional district school. Um, so I, I want to make sure that folks don't leave here today with confusion about that so that when you see the recommendations of the commission come out later this year, um, that you won't feel that your comments about charter school fell on deaf ears, but just to know that it is beyond the charges that we're presented with. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, today I'd like to focus on some of the components of the foundation budget that affect urban districts. Um, the first one I'd like to highlight is the English, English language learners formula. Um, this past year we were asked to double the amount of ESOL services that we provide to our kids. However, the funding formula hasn't changed at all and it's, it's put a lot of pressure on our district. Um, also within the ESOL, calculations, um, there's no ESOL money for the vocational kids. And so we have a vocational school in Springfield and almost 12% of the kids are ESOL, ELL, English language learners, and they require ESOL services. And there's no money within the current foundation budget that, but we still have to provide those services to kids. So that's an inequity that definitely affects us and puts a lot of pressure on the rest of the district. Um, the second area I'd like to highlight is preschool. So the state did an excellent job of allowing all the regular education kids to be counted in the formula for preschool. However, everything is based on the prior year enrollment. So we are trying to add classrooms this year. We just purchased a building and we want to add six to eight new pre-K classes. However, we will not receive any revenue until the following year, meaning that we have to come up with money in order to fund that because it's a year in arrears. And these are kids who weren't formally in the district. Across most of the grade levels, that doesn't matter, but in preschool it's pretty important because those kids are brand new and, you know, we recommend that those be funded on the actual pupils at the preschool level as opposed to the prior year enrollment. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate the uh, succinct and direct nature of your testimony. Are there any questions? Yes, sorry. Uh, just a follow-up question on that uh, with respect to the preschool. Uh, um, if yes. I understand you correctly, this would be a problem that would exist just in the one year that you are instituting yes, just the, one the new year. class. So once, so one possibility might be to allow for some sort of adjustments for districts that are adding, actually adding a, uh, a year of education in that particular year. Is that yes. correct? All right, thank you. Thank you. Yes. You just give me a little clarification on your relationship between the vocational school that you say you're providing ESL services. Mm -hmm. is, is the vocational school part of your district itself or it is. Is, or is it a, voc a regional school? No, it's part of our district. We have an in-district vocational school. Okay. Um, I mean, what we're really recommending is that um, the component for English language learners within the foundation budget be removed from the base components and actually put into the increments above the base. We think that's the best way to handle it, and then they would be able to be counted for all kids. Okay, but those students, if they weren't in your vocational component, you'd still be required to provide them the same services? Yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you again very much thank for you. your testimony. 
let's see who's next. We've got uh, Denise Hurst, also from the Springfield School Committee. Is Denise still here? There she is. Okay. Good day, and thank you for the opportunity to give testimony regarding Chapter 70. My name is Denise Hurst, and I'm a proud graduate of the Springfield Public Schools, a parent of a Springfield Public School preschooler, and a member of the Springfield School Committee. As you all are aware, Chapter 70 foundation formula has not changed since its enactment in 1993. And over time, significant flaws have developed, and consequently, there has been a negative impact on urban districts such as Springfield. Many of our students require services and attention to remove barriers to education. There is a considerable amount of funding from our budget allocated to provide social, emotional wraparound services, extended learning time, tutoring interventions, summer school, night school, credit recovery, athletics, after school programs, and other necessary services. While the current foundation formula does provide an additional amount for every low-income student, the funding isn't adequate enough to address the issues that students living in poverty face. We recommend that the funding for each low-income pupil be increased by at least $500. School districts across the Commonwealth are forced to absolve the costs that come with unfunded mandates. Starting this past school year, as referenced by Pat Roach earlier, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has required that the amount of ELL services we provide to children be, be doubled. Still, the funding for ELL services has stayed the same. We recommend that the foundation budget for ELL pupils be increased to reflect this new mandate. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts has set the highest academic standards in the nation. Research has shown that early education can yield life-changing positive results for a child. Yet and still, we have failed to address the flaws that exist in the foundation formula to ensure sufficient return in our investment. Preschool is a proven early intervention that has strong nationwide bipartisan support. Last year, the state made a major investment in this category by expanding the amount of regular education pupils who are eligible for this funding. However, funding in the foundation budget is based on prior year enrollment. This means that as Springfield Public School plans to open four additional pre-K classrooms next year, we have a funding gap of over $700,000, which will most likely force reduction in other areas of the budget. These are just a few of the issues. Not enough time has been allotted to highlight the deficiencies that exist with charter school reimbursement, special education services, and employee benefits. When preparing to make a recommendation on behalf of this commission, I urge you to remember districts like Springfield, other impoverished urban districts who need funding at a minimum net school spending. This means that we are solely dependent on the foundation budget for supporting our students' needs. Deficiencies and inequities in the formula affect us more than wealthier districts who can afford to spend above foundation. When certain categories of the formula fall short, we must cut in other areas to make up for it. Please invest in our children, and thank you so much for visiting us here in Western Massachusetts. Thank you. Um, I have one quick question, although I'm just gonna check with the other commission members to see if they have any first. Yes, go ahead, down the end. I believe that you said that there was a seven, need for $700,000 to expand for early education. Is that, a, is that a one year problem? In other words, the foundation budget would ostensibly take care of it after the first year? Yes, to my, to my knowledge, although I'm sure that there could be long lasting impacts to that current, to that deficit should we have to face that. Thank you. Um, you mentioned in your testimony Ed, that the, uh, the low income allotment is not sufficient to meet the needs for the services that you're actually providing on the ground um, for students in that category. And I think there was a specific number that you mentioned in, in recommending increasing it by at least $500. $500. Was there, how did you arrive at that figure? Our, our chief financial officer, Pat Roach, was, gave us the statistics. Okay, if there's, um, if there's any backup to that, how you arrived at that number that, that you or Mr. Roach would be willing to, Absolutely. Um, to give to the commission, that'd be really helpful. Absolutely, we plan on submitting ready and testimony. Great. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Uh, Dan Warwick from also Springfield Public Schools.
Good morning. Uh, we appreciate you coming out here to Western Mass today to hear testimony about the foundation budget. I think in 1993 the foundation budget was a huge step forward in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and we appreciate all the help we've been given. Since then, I think some costs have changed dramatically, and it's time to take a look at it, and we certainly appreciate you taking a look at that foundation budget. You've heard a lot of testimony from people from Springfield here today, and I think I want to just highlight a few points. Uh, Patrick Roach is going to put together the piece on, on preschool and everything and give you more data on, on the costs and low income. But to highlight the, the low income issue, Springfield's almost 90% free and reduced lunch, like Holyoke Lawrence and some other urban centers. I think our population is very needy. Preschool is a need for us. We need to expand preschool. We can't take care of everything you know, uh, K to 12 any longer. So we're really working hard to add preschool classes and work towards preschool for all of our students. And this one year assistance to help us expand our preschool will be tremendous. And again, it's only a cost for one year because the, the money we're gonna get, in, in, which we appreciate uh, building it into the budget for our regular ed students, uh, will help us keep it going in the future, but we need that help for one year. Another thing with low income students, and we found this, uh, when uh, schools were put into level four status, we were encouraged to put a lot more wraparound services, extended time, extended day, extended year. There's a cost to those services that, that urban centers face. In an urban center like Springfield, we don't have the property tax revenue to go beyond minimum net school spending. So we know, based on the gains made in our level four schools, that funding for these kind of wraparound services would help tremendously. Instead of naming a school level four, because they don't have the funding to provide the kind of services poor urban students need. I'd rather see us put the money in to provide those services at all our schools so our kids will be doing well moving forward. Um, I'm a lifelong special educator, I was a special education teacher, special education supervisor. I support all the work we do in special education. I think it's vital for those students. But in an in a urban center like Springfield, where 19.1% of our, our students are in special education, the cost of the in-district services have, have risen rapidly. And what we'd like to say, say is that at this point, the mandate is underfunded. We need some help looking at the real numbers and the real costs, and, and it's costing us. We're actually cutting services to regular ed students to do the right thing for special education students, and we shouldn't be put in that position. Same thing with the out-of-district costs. I, I embrace the students getting the services they need, but we need to look at the, the real cost of programs, which has ri risen dramatically, and adjust the formula to help us pay for those costs. I think what Pat Roach mentioned earlier about our ESOL students, that ESOL mandate from the DOJ to double the time for ESOL services, again, we embrace it. We think the kids need the services, but I think the reimbursement needs to reflect our costs with that. Um, and then the employee benefit piece, again, uh, our employee benefits have risen dramatically. And uh, again, some help with that, especially health insurance, uh, has resulted in a dissipation of services to our students. So I think it's very important to take a look at cities like Springfield, Holyoke, Lawrence, the gateway cities that really struggle. Our, our uh, mayor and school committee are great, but unfortunately we're at minimum net school spending. And we don't have the ability to raise any revenue beyond that. So we really live and die off the Chapter 70 reimbursement. We're so happy you're here today to listen to our testimony and, and help with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warwick. Questions from the committee? Yes, Ooh, you're a popular one. Go ahead and let's start at the far left and work our way in. Thanks. Uh, a follow-up that I neglected to ask the last speaker. The 700000 to implement the first year of pre-K um, that's, say, plus or minus about 10 sections of pre-K, for argument's sake. We're opening a new center, expanding classes, and it really ref would reflect our additional cost for that first year. Okay, so the, the question was, is the 700000 inclusive of any capital needs, or do you already have the no, space? No, the mayor really stepped forward in our school committee and city council, and we took care of the capital needs. That's just the cost to run the programs, to expand the programs. And it, again, that's a one-year cost, because uh, the reimbursement now is, is uh, much better for preschool, and we appreciate that. Coley. How much of your increase in uh, special needs 
has been caused by mental health problems in the schools? Significant. Uh, the mental health challenges, hence the need for wraparound services. We've been able to bring City Connects in to actually connect kids to mental health centers. It's been tremendously helpful. But I only had the money to do it in some of our level four schools because I had some SIG grant money to help with that, which we appreciated. But that's been help tremendously helpful, connecting kids and getting them to clinics. And what you find in poor urban centers, the families that need those services the most won't access those services without help. So tremendous increase in the mental health issues, and there's a, a significant cost associated with that. And, and that's why we, we were recommending in these low-income areas some help with for, for, for trying to provide those wraparound services. Second question, uh, do you feel there should be some way that schools who might be almost come into being, you know, uh, four or five schools uh, get money ahead of time so that they can uh, offset some of those continuing problems? Yeah, if that was built in to the formula increase, we could have something like City Connects in every school so we're connecting these families to the services. Typically, they're community services, but the poorest segments of the population don't access those services without support. So the social worker in the school to connect families to services is, is essential and it and it showed because we had we had five level four elementary schools exit level four status and, and the wraparound services were a key component in that so if we could work up front to connect these families I think it would save us money down the road with more significant services Senator Jalen did you still have a question yeah I had a question about the funding in level four and if you could give us some documentation about what kinds of outside funding you got, what was required from Springfield, what you spent it on, and what happened to that funding when you left level four. You don't need to do it now, but I would be very interested in, in some detail about, I'm really interested in how turnarounds become turnarounds and what happens in them and what happens afterwards. So if you could give us some documentation on the spending and what you spent it on and what happens afterwards, I would really appreciate it. Those are great questions and we'll be glad to do that. Thank you. Um, two questions for me. One, just a quick one. Is Springfield a GIC community? Yes. And then secondly, um, on the recommendation about the first year of your, your startup costs for pre-K, uh, in previous hearings, not specific to pre-K, but just with uh, the enrollment count generally, we've heard some um, testimony that is in, in tension with one another. Uh, some some folks asking for um, a later cutoff date for the annual headcount in order to reflect students that come to you mid-year, um, but others uh, asking for uh, more predictability in the funding, you know, knowing earlier on in the prior year what the Chapter 70 number is going to be so that you can, you know, build your budgets around it. Uh, so I'm just wondering if there's any recommendation that you would make uh, if, uh, if the state were able to, you know, figure out a mechanism for giving first year startup funding, when, when would be the ideal time to sort of to capture that headcount number? Yep. October 1 of that year, I you think, would, go would be the right one. number. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank As you. opposed to the next year. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. That brings us to Tim Collins from the SEA. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Collins. I've been a teacher in the city of Springfield for 43 years. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the genesis of the foundation formula. Springfield was one of the lead communities that sued the state, went all the way to the state Supreme Judicial Court, that ruled that funding for education was not only inadequate, but not equitable. And a lot of the testimony you've heard kind of really defines that. But I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective of someone who looks in the face of children every day. You know, the Commonwealth has set some of the highest standards in the country. And I'm no teacher is against high standards. However, this formula hasn't changed since 1993. The conditions in the city of Springfield are dramatically different. The poverty, is much higher, unemployment is higher, the number of kids in foster care is higher, the number of kids who are homeless is higher, the number of kids who are adjudicated in our correctional 
system is higher. I am not against holding high standards. However, if you set high standards and you recognize that kids come to school at different developmental stages, what's happening in their families and their neighborhoods affects their readiness for school. We need to have the kind of supports necessary for children who face those challenges so that they can overcome those challenges. Children from poverty are resilient and if we provide them the support they need, they can succeed. And a perfect example of that is what happened with our level four elementary schools when they got the, the school improvement grants. They could provide PD, they could provide the services that the superintendent talked about. And they did much better. Every child in every school deserves to have that kind of support. If there's a need, we need to support it. And we're not. You know, this is the civil rights issue of our time. The detractors of public education, and I don't view it as a marketplace. This isn't about profit, win or loss. This is about developing children. The social, emotional, spiritual, and physical growth of these kids is every bit as important as the academic growth. Across this Commonwealth, art, music, and a number of programs where kids could develop those skills, they call them soft skills, you know, how to work with one another, how to collaborate, how to have some confidence in yourself, how to stick with difficult tasks to fruition. Those are things that happen with human contact, lower class sizes. We need, and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts says we should cherish education. And in my mind, that means we need to cherish every child. And if they need support to hit those high standards, it's up to us as adults and responsible citizens to provide that support. And this foundation formula does not do that. And shame on all of us. We talk about every child can, can succeed. We, it's up to us to create the circumstances so that that can become the truth in every school, in every city, regardless of the wealth and the challenges those cities meet. So I'm more interested in doing what's right for the children in our charge. And I think over the last 10 years, actually Superior Court Judge Bosworth did 10 years ago another study and her recommendation was we're falling back. You need to go back and read those recommendations because these children are our future. And it's up to them to see to it that they have what they need so that they can become productive parents, neighbors, and citizens. And we're simply not doing what we need to be doing for these children. You heard the technical and the financial formula, but this is about building relationships with kids who may not have healthy relationships in their home, in their family, in their neighborhood. We can save these kids and help them become productive human beings and good citizens and good parents, but we need to support our public schools to the extent where if there's a need, it's met, and we simply are not doing that now. Thank you for your time. Welcome to the eastern end of Western Massachusetts. <laughs> we often feel that we are the undiscovered country. You know, we got a grant in Springfield from the NEA Foundation, Closing the Achievement Gap Grant. One of the things we did with it was have a parent-teacher home visit program, which has great success. Another thing was provide professional development for people. Another thing we did was to have full day summer school so we can cut out the summer learning loss that many of our kids come behind the eight ball, the loss year after year keeps them falling further behind. These are the kinds of needs that these children have, and if we meet those needs, they will be successful. But that's all done, us going hat in hand to phil philanthropic organizations. Mm. 
And outside of 128, we don't have that kind of money. But it doesn't mean our kids don't need it, and it doesn't mean our kids don't deserve it. So please, let's cherish every child and create a formula that not only holds up the high standards, but provides the support so that every child can meet those standards. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Questions for members of the commission? Seeing none, I thank you again for your testimony, Mr. Collins. Next up, we have Devin Sheehan from Holyoke School Committee. Hello, my name is Devin Sheehan and I am the Vice Chair of the Hoyoke School Committee. In addition, I am the Chair of the Connecticut Valley Division of the Massachusetts Association of School Committees and a member of the MASC Board of Directors. Today, however, I speak to you as a locally elected official. I have four key areas of concerns to raise with you. First, as someone who represents a district at severe economic and social risk, I urge you to study the relationship between the foundation budget and the actual cost of educating a student. I believe that the foundation budget is understated by at least 20 to 25 percent and has been for a decade. The result of inflation outpacing the cost of education and health-related benefits. A recalibration is overdue and should be expedited to facilitate the adjustments necessary. Second, the Commission must implement adjustments to assure appropriate accounting of and spending for students with special education needs on one hand and employee and retiree health insurance costs on the other. At this time, legislatively set census data for special education are four to six times lower than the actual numbers, and this is a particular problem for high-risk districts. Third, I recommend that you calculate specifically for the number of transient and homeless students and provide some additional relief through the foundation budget. These are students at great risk who, like high-need special education clients, have no alternative other than traditional public schools. They merit special consideration because while they are eligible for free and reduced lunches, they tend to represent not only people at severe economic disadvantage, but the poorest of the poor for a community. Fourth, I ask that you take note of the economic impact of expanding charter schools, given that in many communities, the foundation budget is very closely aligned to the amount of state aid taken from affected districts and given to charter schools. Many districts budget right at foundation level, and should a charter school take a child from it, the district loses the average per student spending amount of dollars. Not the average state aid per student, but the average of total per pupil spending in that district. In most communities across the Commonwealth, the local taxpayers contribute more than the state does to the district budget. As a result, the foundation budget often determines how much of the tab that is paid for by local taxpayers' share that will go to charter schools that is not accountable to that community and its taxpayers. Finally, representing a district in crisis, I urge that you not punish schools with hardworking teachers and local leaders behind them who go to work every day to do battle with the insidious forces of poverty, unemployment, and social injustice by linking financial assistance through Chapter 70 to performance on standardized testing that has not been an effective tool for prescribing solutions to the problems undermining student achievement. What does the number 220,000 mean to you? To me, it means 3.5 teachers. To the Commissioner of Education, it is the price to pay for a receiver from July to November to manage one 383 student public school with no government oversight. That it is an additional amount of spending above the foundation budget allocated to communities with schools that are in receivership. As you know from the materials submitted to you, including a position paper from the School Superintendents Association, which I am in full agreement with, there are many recommendations for tweaking ratios for calculating wealth and per capita dollar multipliers. I leave to you those fine details, but they still do not address the basic question of adequacy that will be resolved with a whole scale recalibration. Thank you again to the members of the commission. I know that you have a long task in front of you and we do appreciate it as school committee members and members of the community that this is being examined. So let's work together and partner to provide the best equitable education for the students in the Commonwealth. Thank you. Please, 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 please. Senator Jalen, do you have questions? Just a quick question. Sure. The 220,000, yes. where's that money come from? 
That is money that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has allocated to pay for a receiver, and that's uh, as, that number I pulled from the Mass Open Checkbook uh, that were payments that were made uh, between July and December. I'm assuming there'll be more as the spring comes, but it was to an outside uh, company to manage one school. It came out to about $542 per student uh, extra in that school just for that amount, which if you think it's a manager, our superintendent makes 160,000 a year managing a 58 person, 5,800 person school district. So you think that 220 goes to a project manager um, or corporation to manage one school. Um, I don't think in Western Mass there's any superintendent whose base salary would be 220. Just to clarify, you have two schools in? We have uh, one school that's a level five school, it's an elementary, it's a K to eight school, uh, and we have one school that is a level four school, a vocational school, that is also uh, managed with a partner. It's not in level five, but it's a partner, and it's the same partner. And who pays for that? The district. The district pays for the partner. The district has to pay for the partner since it's a level four. We can use various grants to pay for that funding um, through school improvement grants, and when Race to the Top was available, we could use funds to pay for that partner, but that was a, a, a pretty much a state mandated partner that we had to hire. I can't say that we were mandated, we were given an ultimatum. Hire a partner or the district is mine. Any other questions? I did have one follow up question. Sure. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding you rightly. Uh, when you referenced uh, urging us to not uh, tie Chapter 70 funding to performance on the MCAS or any successor yes. test, um, what, what are you referring to in that? Is, is there a current practice? No, I view as it was more of a, a cautionary speak that we can't tie student performance towards how much a district gets. We need to base it on need. So I, I don't want to see that if a student is outperforming or a district is outperforming and in a higher percentile that they may get greater amounts of money. Standardized testing isn't a way to tell where a, where a district needs okay. money. Okay, so you're saying you're saying just sort of make sure we don't do correct. that. Not that there's something that That's you correct. see happening today That's that correct. is that. Okay, gotcha. Uh, thank you very much. Oh. I see another question, okay, so thank, thank you, you very, very much. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, Jeremy Whalen, am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, you got it. Hi, my name is Jeremy Whalen. I'm a, a tech teacher actually at Northampton High School. Um, and thank you to the commission. And also thank you to, you probably can't see him, but there are two students here. Uh, Sam and Dominic uh, working this event and it's a great way for them to get kind of hands-on experience while helping out their community. What I want to talk today about was some of the unique challenges that Western Mass faces as opposed to some, to some of the uh, eastern parts of the state. Uh, internet connectivity out here in a, in a region that uh, is geographically uh, larger and it's more, our populations are more sparse. Uh, it's a real challenge for one, connectivity for students, uh, internet-wise, and also as a result, there's uh, less of an emphasis on some of those technologies that are at home. So when they come to school, they rely on these technologies, uh, and, and as a tech instructor, uh, what I'm seeing and what I'm concerned about is the minimum threshold in which I can utilize some of these resources uh, for my students. Uh, I have one example here. Um, um, our computers, as well as some of our, our technology, uh, is really outdated. Uh, we are usually perceived as a kind of affluent community, although if you were to come in, some of the things that uh, Superintendent Provost outlined were uh, really a, uh, the infrastructure is, is not here. We just received Wi-Fi, and it's, it's as you could probably see on your <laughs> tablets, uh, it can be uh, sparse. So uh, some of these things that, uh, what I really, the recommendation that I would, I have here is a, uh, maybe an audit or a review of where we want all of our schools throughout every district, uh, the minimum technology threshold for students to, uh, achieve. Uh, Currently, I'll, I'll give you a couple of uh, instances of the consequences of not having a minimum threshold here. Uh, our computers are so outdated that some of the uh, initiatives that I would love to take uh, and, and utilize in my classroom, uh, one, for example, is the White House initiative that is called ConnectEd, which offers uh, great programs 
literally tens of thousand dollars worth of programs for free to our students. I'm unable to install those on our computers because they are so outdated. Um, and it's a real shame. These are, these are, these are industry standard uh, software programs uh, that when we always talk about promoting STEM and promoting our technologies, these students have the ability, there's the resources there from the federal, on the federal level, but when it comes down to the state level, uh, we're just not able to meet uh, those requirements, uh, unfortunately. Another example of uh, equipment is, I teach a photography class, and this is one of the cameras that uh, I came into uh, teaching this year, uh, we were uh, using. This is a camera, uh, PowerShot A520. Uh, if you were, uh, the, it debuted in 2005, and if you were to go on eBay right now, uh, these are going for somewhere in the region of $12.50. So when you look at the technology, when, when you're looking at communities and the perception of those communities that, that uh, there's really a discrepancy between uh, what is offered on the, uh, what is offered and also what the resources are. So I'd love to see some sort of audit or some sort of uh, uh, dealing with saying we need, we must be at this minimum threshold here to really give our students the opportunity to succeed in the areas of technology. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the commission? Did I see? Um, just one quick question: the, the the minimum standard that you're um, that you're envisioning is for for schools or for students? I think that it would be for uh, for schools. I would love to see uh, goals outlined, and also uh, based on those goals, some sort of uh, application from IT administrators or IT directors within uh, districts and communities to come together and say these are the goals that we would need to accomplish, and these are the technical aspects because there is really a disconnect I see between some of the things that we really want to accomplish for students and getting lost in that technical stuff. If you were to come into my classroom, for instance, you would notice 30 computers in that room. That doesn't mean those 30 computers are at any, anywhere near the capacity to run anything that we're talking about now. Uh, so we, you would come in and you would basically see something that you could use Microsoft Word on. Um, so we, we kind of see this kind of layer of, oh, well, there's these resources, but really understanding what those technical requirements are to see that level of achievement is, is what I was uh, referring to. Thank you. Um, seeing no further questions, thank, thank you, you again for coming today. Um, we're making progress onto our second page. Uh, Nancy Stenberg from Frontier Regional. Oh, there you are. And now for something completely different. <laughs> I'm a librarian and I am a teacher. I have a master's of education in library teaching. I chose this master's degree over a master's of library science because I wanted to be a teacher. As you shape the future of education funding for the students of the Commonwealth, I ask you to consider your own childhood memories. Did they include trips to the school library? Of course they did. For some of our students, they will not. eSchool News recently published their top 10 list of the most influential ed tech developments for 2014. Number one, the new role for school librarians. I quote, school librarians have evolved from quiet School libraries, excuse me, have evolved from quiet places to read books into bustling centers of collaboration, learning, and research. School librarians are emerging as leaders as they help teachers learn valuable technology integration skills. They also teach students how to research and evaluate information. I teach at a rural regional school of 600 grades 7 through 12 students. On a typical day, I see an average of 250 students and staff members. My patrons walk in individually with passes before school, during lunch, and after school. They arrive with their teachers who have booked computers, table space, or the classroom for their classes. I co-plan research projects with social studies, science, math, health, and English teachers, introducing the projects with lessons on proper source citation, the differences between databases and websites, how to recognize a credible website, how to create footnotes, and where to find books on their topics. Yes, they still use books. During the projects, I circulate amongst the students while they work on their papers, reminding them of the skills I introduced to them. After the projects, I meet with the teacher to discuss what went well, what could have been better, and what can be done differently. 
I reset passwords, update and troubleshoot iPads, Chromebooks, laptops, and desktops. I work with special education staff to find and download apps for them to use with their work with their students. I supervise one instructional assistant and five student assistants. I meet with English classes who come in to choose books for reading and share new titles and tried and true classics. I order books that we do not have through interlibrary loan and work one-on-one -on -one to find just the right book for a reluctant reader. On professional development days, I teach workshops to staff members on Google Apps, iPad Apps, and other software applications our school is using, providing an ongoing link between staff and student. All in all, I urge you to consider placing an emphasis on making sure that all schools get the library and the professional librarian that their students deserve. I leave you with the recommendation which you have already received in writing from the Massachusetts School Library Association. Again, I, is that my three minutes? Damn, I practiced this. All right, well, you already have that in writing, and here is my testimony in writing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Ms. Emberg. I really appreciate it. And I do, I do want to take that uh, moment to just let give everyone a little bit of a status check. We probably have about four hours of testimony ahead of us if we proceed at the same pace that we've been at. So I'm going to get a little tougher about enforcing the three-minute rule. Um, and I would just ask you to, to really um, uh, exercise judgment if someone uh, from your district or others from other districts have said things that um, really echo what you have to say. We certainly will not, um, you know, downgrade the importance of that if you could come up and say, you know, ditto what that guy said um, before me or just submit your written testimony, which we surely will review. So thank you for your, um, your restraint in observing the three-minute rule. Are there any questions from the commission? Seeing none, we're going to motor on um, to the next person, which is uh, Barbara Bitgood. As Barbara, as Barbara comes forward, uh, I'm just going to take a moment to do what I should have done one person ago, which was to thank uh, Mr. Whalen's students who are providing the tech support for us today, um, and also mention that um, video for this hearing is going to be posted uh, after the hearing uh, at www.nhstechnology.org. I'll mention that again at the end, but um, thank you so much for your, for your technological support today. Um, Ms. Bitgood. Distinguished members of the Foundation Budget Review Commission, my name is Barbara Bitgood and I teach French here at Northampton High. It has been my pleasure to teach here for the past 13 years. First, I'd like to thank you for th taking the time to listen to the concerns of those of us who work daily to educate the children of Massachusetts. The Commonwealth's commitment to funding a sound education for every child is commendable and has paid off in high levels of performance achieved by our students. Yet that tradition of educational leadership is on shakier financial footing than it was 20 years ago after the Chapter 70 formula was first implemented. I'd like to speak to you of the changes I've seen in my decade teaching in this building and the challenges that we currently face. When I first came to Northampton High in 2004, I taught exactly 100 students over the course of the year. This year I will teach 140. Class sizes within the World Language Department now regularly reach 30 or more students, and many students are turned away from courses due to over-enrollment. We have long been in need of another teacher, but there have simply not been the funds to make that happen due to the need to redirect monies toward programs for high-needs students and supports that are required by the state. Consequently, each year for the past four years, certain courses have been cut due to lack of staffing, and dozens of students have had to delay or cut short their language studies because we can't afford to hire another teacher. With the rise of class sizes has come a dramatic increase in the proportion of students with individual education programs and Section 504 plans. These students often require more individual attention within the classroom, supplemental or alternative materials, and intensive communication between teachers, special educators, and parents. I'm glad that we are identifying learning disabled students and those with mental illnesses earlier and more accurately than we were a decade ago, but it is a daily struggle to meet their needs adequately when class sizes are so large. While much has changed, I can think of two things that have not in my years here. I'm still using the same desktop computer running Windows ME that I had when I first stepped into my classroom. The technology in the school is a hodgepodge of used computers donated by Smith College, machines purchased primarily through the PTO, through their extraordinary fundraising efforts, and the occasional new machine that we can fit into the budget. The second thing that hasn't changed in many a year is the textbooks that we're using. I'm allotted $500 annually to purchase all of the classroom supplies and textbooks that my students need. Mm -hmm. As you can well imagine, that money doesn't go very far. Some of the books that my students are using this year were printed before they were born. 
During my time with the Northampton Public Schools, the citizens of Northampton have demonstrated their commitment to education by twice passing Proposition 2.5 overrides to meet school budget gaps. The local community has done its part, and I respectfully ask that the state amend the Chapter 70 formula to more effectively fund a 21st century education. The funding formula should reflect the actual expenses of establishing a modern technology infrastructure within our schools, helping the increasing numbers of special needs students, and providing the larger range of services that are needed within our schools to serve all of our children. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Questions from members of the commission? Seeing none, thank you again, Ms. McGood. Uh, Michael Sullivan from Gil Montague. We uh, were very mindful of the time, so my, my uh, remarks are about five minutes long, so my business manager and I, we're gonna cheat in between the two of us. She's a speaker too, well she's after me on the list. Okay. So she's got, it's a, it's a, it addresses a separate issue, so we're two different people. <laughs> with one statement. <clears throat> Dear Foundation Budget Review Commission, as Superintendent of Gil Montague Regional School District, I wish to share my perspective on two of your four specific requests for information. First, you've asked what educational programs and services are necessary to provide the Commonwealth students with an adequate education. According to Owens and Kaplan, national experts in school finance, adequate funding may be defined as providing sufficient funds to teach the average student to state standards and then to identify how much each district or school requires to teach students with special needs, <clears throat> the learning disabled, those from poverty, and those without English proficiency to the same high and rigorous achievement standards. Mr. Superintendent, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just, I, I, I note that you're reading the testimony that has been sub submitted, written yeah. to the members of the commission, and I just, I really need to ask you if you can give us the high points. Uh, it, you know, okay. with this, this hearing is scheduled to go till one o'clock, okay. and we're already right. gonna be Great. well over that. Here's my idea. Reverse how you do figuring out foundation budget. Let's start with the schools that are successful. There are 17 districts where um, kids scored, or where 99 or 100% of the kids scored uh, advanced or proficient on MCAS last year. So I averaged out the, uh, the total per pupil costs for those 17 adequately uh, funded, or those, high, those adequate performing schools, and it's $14,571. So, that's what we should all start with. That's what the rich districts get. That's what they spend. Let's start with that. And then districts like ours, where 50% of the kids are um, low income kids, and we have a lot of ELL kids or whatever, we'll keep doing what the foundation formula has already done, add, add money on top of that for the expensive to teach kids. So that's a suggestion. I need to tell you that in Gil Montague, um, we, cut over six, a net reduction in six jobs last year. We are looking to cut many more than that in the coming year. We, like Springfield, have lots of kids that come to school with lots of challenges from home. And it's expensive to help those kids with behaviorists and with good social and emotional learning programs and so on. We know what to do. If we direct a lot of resources towards those things, we end up cutting a lot of the more traditional stuff. And in my testimony, you can see all of the things that we don't do or we don't do well because uh, we don't have the funds for that. And then I have some, we have something more specific uh, to mention about what uh, the impact of how foundation doesn't do well by us as being a small district. So Joanne, if you want to just summarize that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joanne Blyer. I'm the Director of Business and Operations at Gil Montague. I've worked in school business for 20 years, and so I've been looking at this foundation budget in various areas of Franklin County. Um, a small district is gonna have a higher per pupil cost. It's just, it's gonna happen because you just don't have any, as many students to cover the overhead. So one quick example is the foundation formula provides for a nurse for every 500 students. Most rural schools here in Franklin County or in Franklin County and Western Mass don't have 500 
students in them, but yet you have to have a nurse because these schools are very rural. So the Chapter 70 formula allows for a wage adjustment factor in the high cost areas of the state. So we're recommending a rural adjustment factor for small rural schools who don't have schools that hold 500 students that the foundation budget is built for. The other problem in our small schools is that we have a, a change in enrollment affects our district more significantly than it does in a larger district. So if we lose 20 kids, we may lose a student for every, every grade. But we can't reduce cost for, these, for the school. We have to continue to operate. We have to continue to have the same classes. We can't reduce first grade because we lost 20 kids. We didn't lose 20 first graders. I'm trying to not read it. <laughs> so it's become increasingly important as we lose students that maybe the foundation budget should use a rolling average, a five-year average of enrollment rather than every single year. You lose 20 kids a year. Instead of losing the 20 kids a year, maybe you average five years so that way you're not getting hit by your enrollment reductions immediately each year. That's all I have for you. Thank you. Um, appreciate the very practical suggestion. There are questions from the commission. Yes. Uh, my observation, too, a very practical suggestion. Um, Joanne, the, your boss talked about the 17 districts that scored uh, advanced and proficient on the MCAS and talked about the average per pupil cost. I'd submit that since districts are, there are districts already above that, I don't think anybody would be suggesting that they, that they be lowered. My question is, would you be able to provide us just for that um, illustrative uh, group that, you, that, you, that you've done some research on, where they stand on average actual net school spending versus required net school spending or, or probably better from, in my view, actual net school spending versus foundation budget. That might be, as far as the charge of this commission, might be a more relevant statistic than a per, per, pupil, per pupil cost. I can try. Sorry. Further questions? Seeing none, thank you again, and uh, thank you for your, your forbearance um, with our time limitations. Uh, that brings us to Renee Wood. No, I'm sorry. Was that Ms. Wood? Ms. Wood. Then Renee Wood. Yes. <laughs> thank you, distinguished members of the Commission, for being here. I'm going to take a slightly different perspective, and I'm submitted written testimony, so I'm going to kind of evolve uh, what I've heard today and, and uh, your charge to us to not read our testimony. I'm a selectman in Sheffield, which is in Berkshire County. Um, I am here, though, as a private citizen because our board will be s sending you written documentation and testimony on our regional school district. Um, in my testimony, I have suggested that you identify a number of different factors that are both in the foundation budget and outside of the foundation budget. I urge you to be bold in doing so because what I'm seeing as both a selectman and as a private citizen is that our education funding is bifurcated so badly in this state that you in your limited scope, which is huge, do not have the ability to look at everything that in the final analysis affects how our schools are paid for. And by not being able to look at everything, you are only looking at a small but very significant part of the education costs. Now, in my written testimony, I have identified five different elements that I would like you to look at. And while you may feel that you are limited in your scope to the actual components 
of the foundation budget, I strongly and respectfully urge you to, as you will, listen to all of the testimony given today and read mine, and uh, notice that there are things that affect our education funding that are not within the scope of the foundation budget. Some of those have been identified by previous speakers. But I also, since you control them as the legislature, ask you to strongly look at underfunded and non-funded mandates that are outside of the foundation budget that are subject to annual allocations and therefore, as we're seeing right now with the budget shortfall, um, annual cuts at either the legislative level or the governor's level. I strongly feel that unless your commission um, identifies as many of these factors that are outside of the foundation budget and brings them to your colleagues attention we as a commonwealth will never get this right the foundation budget is limited in what it currently looks at it is limited in the assumptions that it made has made which have as we've seen and has been testified by others are solely understated in terms of cost special education and employee benefits being amongst those. So thank you for being here today and be bold. Um, we are depending on your work to set the stage for the future of our education in, the in our Commonwealth and if we don't educate our children correctly, I do caution that I wonder what the future of our state will be 10, 15, 20 years from now. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the Commission? Yes. Just, a, just an observation about the written, t here I am, the written testimony and, and your synopsis of it. I think this is what our, our chairs have talked about, is from, you've succinctly put in five bullets, things that are in this commission's purview, and probably could have gone for three minutes or longer on each of those bullets. I think it was very well crafted and it's given us some good fodder for what, what this commission's gonna do. So I just wanna applaud that and recognize that it's exactly what the chairs have been, have been talking about for the testimony. Thank you very much. Yes. Likewise, thank you. Um, Richard Frisch from Belcher Town School Committee. Good afternoon. I come to you from a different perspective. I come from a farming community. We don't have a lot of money. We can't raise a lot of money. Our, our sports programs are paid through donation. We don't have big industry, we don't have big business, we don't have large corporations that we can draw on. Everything in our district that's paid for is paid for by the homeowner. We can't afford to keep going this way. I ask your commission to please take a look at, at these farming communities and make adjustments for the fact that we're one of the largest towns in Massachusetts. We have to bus kids all over these towns, but we don't have as many kids and we don't have as many parents and, and, and taxpayers to pay for all that busing. We, we, we have to have the schools. We have to have the heat, the electric, the technology that's being required now through the Park Commission. We don't have the money to go out and buy this stuff. If you don't have the revenues coming from industry, coming from business to go along with the, the homeowner, uh, the tax that's placed on them, you'll never catch up. And if you want to keep this gem of wide open spaces and farm communities in Western Massachusetts, education, your commission has to look at the fact that these, these rural communities that are farming communities have special needs, far different than our cities. Our cities can draw on their industrial taxes, their business taxes. We can't. If anything, we've got to cut our farmers a break to keep them in business because they're starving. So that's what I'm coming here to ask you to please consider the fact that farming communities have special needs and, and try to look at your formulation of the budget to consider us and our needs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fitch. Before you go, let me just check for questions. 
seeing that. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to make sure. Um, next up, we have um, former Representative Rosemary Sandlin. You're all set? Okay, thank you. Um, Casey, is it Pease or Peasy? Yes, ma'am. Come on down. Hello, my name is Casey Pease. I'm a high school student uh, at Gateway Regional High School. And I'm here not only as a concerned citizen, but as a, a concerned student. Now, first off, I want to applaud the state of Massachusetts for being a leader in the nation for education. That is unbelievable. That's amazing. And I also want to state that on the record, I'm not telling you how to do your job, because I don't even know where to start. Um, that's what this hearing is here for, to tell us how to do our tests. <laughs> That's all right. I'm, I'm here giving you the unique perspective, a perspective through the eyes of a student. Now, as a student, I see firsthand how the 9C budget cuts regarding regional transportation mm -hmm. is causing the layoff of seven teachers in my school. I see how the Chapter 70 fund formulas neglect rural regional districts. Now today you will hear all kinds of testimony and in the coming weeks read many more. But today I am telling you that this is not a game of numbers. This is education. And education is not just a mechanical system. It is a human system. Now section three, chapter 70 of the general laws defines the minimum level of school spending necessary to provide adequate education for students. And I wonder what your definition of adequate is because already there has been many cuts to the budget, and now my di district has to lay off seven educators. This is not adequate. This is not acceptable to the promise of public education. As a student, I beg you to remember that education is the best investment in society. And as a student, I do not want to see that investment neglected. Thank you very much. Can you just tell us what school he's from? I'm, I missed that. I'm sorry. Uh, Gateway Regional School. Uh, well, go to the Gateway Regional School District and Gateway High School. It's in Huntington, Massachusetts. Thank you. Thanks. Wait, wait, wait. Don't go anywhere yet, Mr. Pease. Um, I, I do have one question. You know, uh, given the succinct nature of your testimony, which I appreciate, I want to take um, the liberty of asking a, a question. You know, I think that probably I can go out on a limb and say that everyone here on the commission agrees with what you said, and that's why we're here and why we want to be a part of this work. Um, are there suggestions that you can see from your vantage point as a student for um, what's working well that we that we need to be spending more on, uh, or things that in particular you think need to be factored into how we calculate what constant, yeah, what it costs to deliver a, an yes, adequate education? So I, I go to a r rural district, and that means that our school has to pay more money for busing. And uh, we've been, this year we're losing $241,000 to regional transportation, which means we're going to have to lay off um, seven teachers. And the state promised many years ago that they would cover these regional costs, but they haven't done that. And because of that, the education, at least in my school, because of course this is from my perspective, I don't know every other school, but it's, the education is getting neglected there. Um, and also, to be a little radical here, I would love for you to spend less time on standardized testing. To be honest, I am sick of it. You don't learn anything from standardized test scores. I'm, I'm sorry, that's the truth. You can look at your formulas and you can look at your numbers, but what does, uh, what does a test tell you about a student? What does a test tell you about a district? It doesn't tell you anything. So my recommendation is focus your money and focus your ideas on how to improve education, not how to make more tests and have more MCAS and PARC. Uh, Paul Henry, is it uh, Dermoth from Holyoke Public Schools? I'll read only because it'll be quicker. Um, my name is Paul Hyrie Dermoth. I'm the Assistant Superintendent in the Holyoke Public Schools. Uh, we want to thank the legislature and the commission for the work that's happening to review the foundation budget and for the opportunity for stakeholders to be heard through these forums. While Holyoke is a small city, as many know, we're at the heart of the struggle around urban education in Massachusetts. 
We're a district with many challenges, extraordinarily high proportions of students in poverty, students with disabilities, and students who are learning English as a second language, and a history of low student achievement. We know that change is needed in our district, and we're working hard to support improved daily instruction for students and to integrate programs that will reduce dropout rates and attract parents to keep their children in our schools. Within this context, while costs continue to rise significantly each year, we continue to cut each year. Before I became assistant superintendent, I was a principal for eight years. And for each of those eight years, the budget process was fundamentally characterized by tougher and tougher decisions about which positions would be cut. Now at the district level, last year, while reorganizing our district and working to start new programs addressing our challenges, we needed to cut over $3 million from our core budget. That was a gross reduction of about 4% and a significantly greater net reduction when viewed in terms of rising costs for salaries, benefits, special education services, wraparound supports, all the things identified here by multiple leaders as significantly underfunded under the current foundation budget. This resulted in the loss of teaching and student support positions and has limited our ability to implement the kind of innovations needed to make deep changes in Holyoke. We recognize and appreciate the commitment to urban education included when the current foundation budget was implemented by the legislature in 1993, and we urge the legislature at this time to maintain that commitment by updating the budget, the foundation, to reflect the true costs of effectively educating children in our community and in districts like ours across the state. Any questions? Yeah, Tom. Superintendent, um, when did you begin working in the Holyoke School District? 18 months ago. Okay. Oh, when I began working on yeah, the in oh, Holyoke? Um, as a principal in 2005, um, as a director in 2002. I was curious if you had had experience in Holyoke prior to the creation of the foundation budget and the Ed Reform Act. It, it, um, it sounds like you didn't, so you not, not the right person to system. whom to direct my question. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you again. Thanks. Let's see. Uh, Joe Carlin, Mohawk School Committee. Good afternoon. I'm Joe Curlin from the Mohawk Trail Regional School District. I've been on the school committee for about 10 years, and I am very thankful that after 10 years on the committee, the legislature has seen fit to have a look at the foundation budget calculations and what is an adequate uh, level of funding for school districts. The, um, the mandate has been to come up with a minimum level of funding for an adequate education. And I think what we really need to be looking at is an adequate level of funding for an excellent level of education. That students who get an education in Coleraine or in Holyoke should have the same opportunity for education as a student in Newton. But as some other people have said, we face challenges in rural districts. We have high levels of poverty in rural districts as much, maybe not as much, but um, you know, not just urban districts have high levels of poverty, but we also face the challenges of small schools where we, if we have 100 students in a school, we don't have that level of, um, of scale that can where we can spread the costs out. So we need to look at what is adequate funding, not as an average across the state, but given the circumstances of each school or each school district. And just as an example of the challenges we face, if we wanted to close schools and consolidate schools, 
we found when we tried to do that a few years ago, it would cost us more to close schools than to keep them open. So um, there's one other thing that I'd like to bring up here, and that is that we, our towns have fortunately been willing to spend more than the foundation budget calls for, for all of the years that I've lived in this town. And yet it's a constant tension. Uh, we have a budget committee hearing at our school. Parents and students come and say, don't cut this, don't cut this, don't cut this. And we go to the select boards in our towns and they say, you're spending too much. We can't sustain this. And we go into a downward spiral where we have declining enrollment because there isn't enough employment in our towns. We can't support our schools. So more people are questioning whether they want to be in our towns or whether they want to send their students to public schools. We need to maintain adequate levels of public schooling for every child across the state for what it costs to educate that child. Thank you very much. Before you go, let me just check for questions. Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Oh, did you have one? No, I'll let it go. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, let's see. That brings us to uh, John Hockridge from the North Adams School Committee. I also want to note that um, we have been joined by another commission member, Michael Wood, from the Mass Association of Regional Schools. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Hockridge. I'm a member of the North Adams School Committee, and I am uh, MASC Chair of Division 6, which represents the Berkshire County School Committees. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my tes testimony is specific to the components and assumptions that are used in calculating the foundation budget. I understand that the foundation budget for school districts is adjusted each year for inflation and for enrollment changes within school districts. But as you know, some of the calculations within the foundation budget have not changed since it was first rolled out in 1993. It would seem that those specific calculations should be among the primary considerations for adjustment to provide true adequate minimum funding for school districts. My focus is on special education and the costs associated with special education for, for school districts. My understanding is that the foundation budget incorporates within its calculation assumptions a fixed percentage of special education population of 3.75% in, in relation to total enrollment. And that's the number or close to the number that's, <coughs> that's uh, been used since 1993. The true number at last count for special education for all school districts in Massachusetts is 17.1%. My school district in North Adams has 417 special ed kids uh, within a total school district enrollment of close to 1,600. Our percentage of special ed students is 26%. The numbers are high in many of our Berkshire County schools. Pittsfield has over 1,200 with a percent of total enrollment of 19%. Uh, the numbers, uh, Adams Cheshire is 22%. Again, throughout the state of Massachusetts, the average percent compared to total enrollment is 17%. The state of Pennsylvania in their foundation budget calculations uses a percent of total enrollment of 15%. If the foundation budget is meant to represent the true minimum level of adequate funding for school districts, the special education calculation should be at least 15%. Regarding out-of-district residential placement and the circuit breaker, uh, my school district's budget includes a cost of over $800,000 for out-of-district residential placement. That's after the reduction in costs with the help of the circuit breaker. Residential rates are always rising, but the circuit breaker does not. In addition to the $800,000, there are wraparound costs not covered by the circuit breaker, costs associated with in-house programs in place to service at-risk students with, without sending them out of district. 
costs associated with occupational therapy, speech therapy, evaluations, transportation, school psychologists, remedial, remedial software, and so on. All of these recurring costs. I end my testimony with an, with an example that within our school district in North Adams that not only affects North Adams, but uh, also the way the state covers out of district residential placement costs and directly the foundation budget calculations associated with this. In North Adams, and I suspect in many other school districts as well, we have kids who have, a, who have incredible debilitating physical and medical challenges and our hearts go out to them. No one wants to see what some of these kids face each and every day. In North Adams, we have children that are blind and also deaf and also are on feeding tubes and in some cases are also autistic. There is no educational offering we can give these kids that exhibit all of these challenges. And these kids never enter our school district. Yet because they reside in our city, the school district is required to send them and pay for out of district residential placement in spite of the fact that they have never set foot in our schools and never will. The state circuit breaker also pays for this. The cost of sending them out of district placement, which is basically a medical institution, is $160,000 for one of them and $250,000 for another. The circuit breaker covers much of this. If there's any potential educational offering we can give, we absolutely are responsible to see that those offerings are made available to them at any cost. But should not these kids more appropriately be covered through medical coverage and health insurance coverage than by a school district that, is, that has never seen them in our schools? Thank you for taking the time to uh, review the foundation budget, and thanks for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Hockridge. Before you go, let me just check for questions. No one. <laughs> How much is your uh, special ed percentage increased over the last 10 or 12 years? Uh, I don't have a specific number, but it's, uh, it's been huge. Uh, I, I guess. Oh, I guess. Um, uh, over the last 10 or 12 years, yeah. it's probably, uh, um, I, would, I would think it's at least uh, 30 percent, 25, 30 percent. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, before you go, I do have one. Has a, North Adams made, made attempts to, um, to recover some of the medical elements costs uh, of any of those placements from health insurers? Uh, they have. Uh, my understanding is that it just hasn't been possible to do so. Um, that it's, that's directly been covered through the, uh, through the uh, schools. Okay. Did you have a question, Tom? Madam Chair, um, not only in your testimony, but in several testimonies, you mentioned to the lack of changes in foundation budgets over the 20 some years since its adoption. Um, just want to put on the record that beyond the marginal changes such as SPED that went from 3.5 assumption to 3.75, there have been rather small changes in the constitution of it, but the inflation adjustment year to year, you know, has significantly changed the amounts in the foundation budget. So while the programmatic mixture is the topic of this foundation, it's just important people, the general public understand that it's not that they established rates back in 1993 and those are still standing at that level. The other point I want to make is that it's important for people to understand that the special ed assumed enrollment of 375 and the comparison to a rate such as yours of 26, which is particularly high, that is all students who are getting special ed services with 375 is the assumed full-time equivalency. So if someone's getting two hours of speech pathology, they're part of the 26%. So the assumption was that it was, you know, 375 full-time. So um, that equates up to the 17, it gets close, but that's exactly the work of this commission. But. If you put it at an equivalency, it would not approach anywhere near 17 or 26 percent. So, again, the right topic, the the failure uh, or the fidelity of this formula to keep up with changing enrollments is exactly the topic. But just want to make sure people understand that it's not 26 versus 375. It might be 375 versus what? Six, seven. If you put a full-time equivalency, no one, you know, that's the work that we're engaged upon. 
Yeah, it just, it just, it just it needs to be, I understand that point, but it doesn't it definitely need to be considerably higher than the 3.75%. And I understand the inflation increases over years uh, for, the, for the foundation budget, but the, I believe it's an index inflation. It's not representative of real inflation over these years that, uh, that have happened over since 1993. So it's, it's not picking up all of the inflationary increases that uh, Again, we that's, experience. Again, that's precisely what we've been charged to try right. to look at. Okay. Senator Jalen, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I'm thinking back to the woman who from Northampton who said that 20%, 25% of their students left the district for other kinds of school choice, and that those are students who are probably not special ed students. I'm wondering if one of the reasons that we have seen an increase, I just is making me think, and I'm wondering if you can give some thought from North, e North Adams, not now, but later, to say to what extent is the increase within public school districts due to students moving into other choices who don't have those challenges? That's just a question, not for now, for later. Okay. And maybe for other districts, maybe Northampton, since she raised it here. We had a question over on the side, I think. I'm all set. Thank, okay. Thank you again for your testimony. Uh, Daniel Hayes, also with MASC. Okay. Um, that brings us to Jason McCandless, Pittsfield Public Schools. Good afternoon. Uh, though it's not my style, I made this much briefer than it originally was. Um, whether a district's big or small, urban or rural, uh, regional or municipal, I hope that this body continues to focus on mandate relief, focus on a more realistic and honest view of the needs and challenges and costs of educating students with deep, deep needs, be those needs emotional, learning needs, physical needs, and or economic needs. And uh, please continue to focus on really, uh, in our situation, in many situations, what is an all-consuming challenge of, a, of the increasing costs of healthcare and employee benefits, uh, all of which, Focusing on all of these will allow our, our gifted, dedicated teaching professionals to do more of what they do best, which is to help children be scholars and to learn and grow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Being of the political persuasion, we appreciate it is difficult to shorten remarks on the fly. Um, one question from Linda. I have a question for Mr. McCandless, for Superintendent McCandless. Um, we've heard this morning about the two first criteria that the commission is charged with, but we have heard virtually nothing about efficiencies, effectiveness, and models that have been implemented to use resources to their maximum effectiveness. And as a graduate of Pittsfield High School, I am interested in whether the district <coughs> has done anything on those two, and I would certainly welcome any additional um, written testimony that any of the other districts who have testified could submit to those two points. And, and we'd be happy to submit our, our thoughts on that in writing too. You know, except to say, uh, in, in a county like Berkshire County, which has a, a fairly uh, quickly declining student population, um, any, any help, guidance, uh, and or financing to create um, more efficiencies, not only within districts, but among districts, um, would be most welcome. Thank you. Tom. Mr. Superintendent. Following up on Linda's point, and more generally, um, one of my interests coming to Western Mass today was um, not only Berkshire County, but uh, several of the counties have experienced significant student decline. Yes. And any thoughts about how the formula can appropriately capture what would be if, what would be an appropriate mechanism for the state funding flow? Could it be improved? Could mechanisms be improved to capture that experience that local districts out here are challenged to manage? It has to be an enormous challenge. And any specific testimony that people want to give around those points would be very much appreciated by me. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the next person on the list, I'm not totally sure, I think it says Bobby Jones from Hampshire Regional. Is that right? Do we have a Bobby Jones in the house? I think this, I don't know if this one, no. Okay, all right, I'm going to uh, skip ahead then. Uh, Robert 
flashback. There you go. <laughs> we got to work on handwriting. <laughs> As you come to the mic, I also just want to recognize that we've been joined uh, by Representative Aaron Vega, who's in the back. Thank you for joining us today. You can. Um, uh, Mr. Ashback. Ashback. Hi. Thank you. My name is Rob Ashback, Chair of the Mohawk Regional School Committee. We are the largest geographic school committee in the mm -hmm. Commonwealth, covering 250, 252 square miles. Mm -hmm. As people have said earlier today, one of our biggest issues is the regional transportation and it impacts on how we then have other allocations to spend our money. Not putting rural districts against regional districts, and I know it may be out of your preview of Chapter 70, but Chapter 71 has been underfunded for years. It dramatically affects what we can do. As my colleague from Mohawk said, Joe Curlin, from a rural regional school district, we still have to provide small elementary schools. If we lose one or two students, it doesn't allow us then the ability to reduce our staffing. We have four elementary schools, my junior, senior high school. We cover this large geographic district. We still need the nurse, we need the principal, we need other people to handle all the mandates that the Department of Education puts down on us. Though when we have our enrollment drop from 1,500 students to 950 students, we don't have that. We lose a student in Colerain, two students in Heath. We still have the whole thing. So it's when you look at this, Again, as someone said, with also the special education costs for us to transport a special education student from Heath to Northampton to Springfield. We don't get reimbursed for the costs, and our cost is very high per pupil. Giving time for other people, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Just let me check for questions real quick. Yep, we have one. Can you tell me how many towns are in your district? There are eight towns in our district. Eight towns in our district, and as someone else said, our towns, on an average, pay 55% of their budget for public education. As someone said, we then get into the discussion of it's not what the towns want to pay for, what they have the ability to pay for. And you, you mentioned you have four elementary schools covering those eight towns. We have four elementary schools, one junior, senior high school. And have you recently, has the committee looked at uh, possibility of reducing to three? Uh, what are the, what are the uh, hurdles to, to reducing the number of buildings? When most of the regional schools were put, were put together, the um, central theme was that to get it passed in regional districts, the ability to close schools is almost impossible. In our district, it would take all eight towns with a yes vote to close any of these schools. Thank you. Uh, Tom, yes, go ahead. Following up, sorry. I'm sorry, another Tom, question. Go ahead. We have uh, one more question. Following, I actually have a question. I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. Following up on um, on that question, does the district currently have buildings that are uh, funded by MSBA, and how is that has the provision that if a school is closed? the MSBA funding? Yes, so we do have are you, are buildings you, which are funded by MSBA because over the years our buildings have had uh, various programs put in to uh, update them with heating and so forth. There, we have had discussion with the legislature and MSBA of what we could do on that re respect. And are they, were they major renovation? I'm, I'm oh yes, at, because most of our buildings are dated and so they've had major renovations and the towns have paid for this. We also know then that we've approximately got about 78% reimbursement. Is what, I guess what I, I think you can hear what the, the question is, is has that posed an obst obstacle to um, consolidating schools or, or grades? Because I'm looking at an enrollment loss in Mohawk, if I've got it right, over the last 14 or 15 years of 44%. That is correct. Uh, the ability is that the distance of transportation and also right. then that how long can we keep an, a small child on a bus? Right now, we push the state limits beyond what we should be for having children for transportation. So again, as I said earlier, any that is those are the those to me occur as the major right the transportation challenge and then the capital um, uh, help from the state that would be at risk. Correct. If, if there's got so any testimony that you can give us on how that's being managed and what the timelines on that and how you think they could be linked somehow in a response that this commission might give. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, next, we have signed up uh, both Viviana de Jesus and Nani de Jesus. If you want to, I'm guessing that you might be a family unit. If you'd like to come up together, please do. Good morning. So we're two separate individuals, so we hope that we won't yes. be. Yes, okay. no. Thank you. No so first of all, I want to say good morning. Um, my name is Viviana de Jesus, and I'm a parent of a fifth grade student who's with me today uh, at, um, at Sullivan Elementary School in Holyoke. I'm very thankful to you for holding this hearing, and I'm very glad that the legislature had agreed to revive, has agreed to revive the foundation budget uh, commission to address crucial issues of educational funding in the Commonwealth. I want to take some time to say thank you to people who are important to me in my life who are here today, and that is Vera Cage of Amherst, uh, Matthew Cunningham Cook of Holyoke, Mechtis Soul Garden of, of Holyoke, and Monique Cage of Amherst, another public school student. Um, and so um, my daughter's school is criminally underfunded by the state of Massachusetts. I use the term criminally deliberately because the McDuffie decision has demonstrated clearly that the Commonwealth has an obligation to provide high quality public education, particularly in low income communities. But despite the fact that 20 years have passed since the McDuffie decision, Cambridge students receive 60% more funding than Holyoke. $27,000 compared to $16,000 per student per year. This has concrete effects for my daughter's education. My daughter does not have an art teacher. My daughter has never had a Spanish class or any foreign language class. There are 31 kids in her class. 31. Jim is only once a week. Gym is only once a week. The quality of food in my daughter's school is awful. Fresh vegetables are rare. If kids are not getting healthy food at home and not getting healthy food in school, they are malnourished and this has detrimental effects for the school as a whole. Teachers in Holyoke are underpaid and overworked, leading to high turnover. This is evident in Sullivan Elementary School where my daughter and I witnessed two consecutive, where two consecutive years we witnessed excellent teachers leave the school to work in other districts. Awesome teachers left. Let's be clear about why this is the case. About why Holyoke and other low income communities around the state schools are criminally underfunded. Racism and classism. The kids in Holyoke schools are 80% of color and 77% qualify for free or reduced lunch. This legislature has not made any efforts to address the savage inequalities in our system, in our school system. By doing so, they have enabled criminality. In a just world, our lawmakers who fail to meet the mandates of the McDuffie decision would be prosecuted for contempt of court. There is only one solution to the funding crisis. The foundation budget urgently needs more money. And that money needs to be dedicated to low income districts. We need to raise the tax on investment income to 28%. Yes, to 28%. This investment income tax exclusively affects households where wealthy, the wealthy are enough to, um, households wealthy enough to own stocks or bonds. If our lawmakers had the courage to do this, there would be $4 billion more for the foundation budget. This is 8,000 for every student below the median funding level in Massachusetts and would bring back our desperately needed art teacher, fund a foreign language teacher and a nutritious lunch and breakfast program. The failure of the foundation budget to adequately fund 
school districts that are predominantly of color and working class is intimately tied to other issues facing Holyoke Public Schools. Tied with underfunding, the greatest threat to my daughter and other kids in Holyoke is the racist education reform movement championed by our state commissioner of education, Mitchell Chester. Chester would like you to think that the issue of underfunding is separate from the issues of overtesting or the privatization of our schools, which hands our children over to profit-driven operators like Project Grad and the District Management Council. He would like you to think that underfunding is a separate issue from the expansion of charter schools which steal money from our public schools or that educational underfunding is, a se is separate from the way that Mitchell Chester blames our teachers and our kids for problems that are a result of systemic racism and classism. Mr. I disagree. Mr. Jesus, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, I just have to note that you're well over the three minute limit. I really wanna make sure we get to hear from your daughter. Um, sure. So can you just, can you just you know, do what you can to wrap up very quickly so that we can pass the mic to her? Sure. I also wanted to say that we've waited two hours and we're parent and student. And you haven't heard from one parent, you've heard from one student in a high school level. Now you wanna hear from an elementary school student. So if and you could one, also, you know, you gave the, the, the uh, politicians enough time and actually over time. Mm -hmm. So if I could have maybe one extra minute, that would be great. You've are, Ms. De Jesus, we are trying to make sure that we hear everyone in the audience today, some of whom may also be students and parents. I appreciate your point. That's why I'm especially glad that you and okay. your daughter are here. We've already extended your time well over one minute. All right, so let, me, let me just up. finish the wrap up. So let's be clear. The so-called underperformance of Holyoke's public schools is a product of this historical underfunding of our schools by the state of Massachusetts. Targeting our schools for takeover, eliminating our democratically elected school committee, instead of working to address the fact that our schools are underfunded is racist. Mitchell Chester acts like our kids should be succeeding by his metric when we do not have the resources to succeed. He uses the MCAS as a metric for success when study after study has shown that standardized tests are biased against black and brown children. The Ms. consolidation Ms. of our Jesus, curriculum. I'm gonna have to ask you to pass the mic to your daughter, please. And this is the problem that I'm having right now with you, that you are actually and if you'd like giving to take extra this up to time me to after politicians. After the hearing is over, I'd be, I'd be happy to stay and you allowed. and I can talk about this, but we need to make sure that we're fair to everyone who has also been but waiting two been hours. Because politicians have gotten enough time, more than enough time, and we have it. So let me just finish my one paragraph, please. <laughs> He uses the MCAS as a metric for success when study after study has shown that, that um, these standardized tests are biased against black and brown children. The consolidation of our curriculum to an exclusively STEM and English school day as Chester mandates completely limits our children's capacity for creativity. I am saying this as the parent of a child who had the highest score on the MCAS in math and consistently reports she is bored at the school. I'm gonna end there and I'm gonna let my thank daughter you. take over. And again, I wanna um, thank the people from Holyoke who are here and the people from the public schools who are here, the teachers and the students, because this room should be filled up with us. I can't, I couldn't agree with you more about that. Good afternoon, my name is Nani. I am a fifth grader at Sullivan School in Holyoke. Today I want to talk about the issue of underfunding and how it affects us students. It affects us because we don't get the stuff that the state is supposed to provide, like a good, healthy, tasty lunch, long time to get any energy out, the learning of other subjects besides math, ELA, and science and social studies, and a good amount of phys ed, but we don't, and that is a big problem. We don't get a healthy lunch. We get a stale, moldy, and horribly tasting food. And sometimes the salad that they're supposed to have every day is gone. And I don't eat anything at all, and then are expected to do good in school without fuel. Anyways, even, even if we did like everything, it would, it would not even be fuel. And we don't get enough time to run around. We only get 15 minutes and are expected to settle down in a straight, quiet line. And then the teachers get mad when we are still jumpy. Sometimes the teachers make us sit on the curb for the whole recess because we did not do our homework. I think this is unfair. We don't learn anything besides math, ELA, science, and social studies, and the occasional music and health. I have never had a Spanish class or a foreign language. And then what we want to learn, like art and computers and foreign languages, we don't get to learn. The stuff we actually do learn is untrue and outdated, like Christopher Columbus. Everyone knows that he didn't discover America, but we still get that pushed in our faces. 
We don't even, we don't even learn about black history. And most of the kids are black and Latinos, yet we still learn about Christopher Columbus. We don't even get phys ed most of the week. These are problems that you Senator Chang Diaz should have solved a long time ago. The time that we spend on testing is ridiculous and there should not be so much testing. And by the way, this is coming from a girl who scored the highest in her grade last year in her MCAS, in her math MCAS. So this is not because I get bad grades. Thank you for your time. Nani, I do want to really give you and, and your mother both um, a special thanks for being here. It is a, a major priority of mine personally, and I think many of the commission members to make sure that we hear loud and clear um, and numerously from parents in this process. And it has been a struggle to um, get equal representation for parents at the hearing, so I really do thank you for being here. If you do have a written copy of your testimony so that we can make sure we get things that you might have had to skip through, um, I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm going to ask Nathaniel to give you my card so that you can make sure we get it, and I'll distribute it to the rest of the, um, the commission members. So thank you for bearing with us. Um, Representative Vega, I understand that you did want to testify. Thank you. <laughs> I understand. It is, as I said at the beginning, it is the practice uh, of the commission uh, that we do take legislators out of turn, alternating them with members of the public. And so we're going to ask, we're going to ask Representative Vega to be very um, observant of the three-minute rule, but it is within the procedures of this hearing to take legislators out of order. Uh, thank you to the commission. Thank you for being here. There was a, an accident on 91, so we were stuck in traffic for the last half hour. I apologize. Um, thank you to the commission for the work you're engaged in. I will be submitting a written testimony. Uh, a couple quick things, although I can already feel the tension in this room. Uh, I hope that we figure out a way not to divide urban schools and uh, our rural schools and our more profitable uh, areas and our more poor areas. Um, the foundation review should not be creating a situation that uh, creates more division between our more fluent districts and our more disadvantaged districts, such as Hoyoke. You've heard a lot of people from Hoyoke today, so I will skip over some of the stuff you've probably already heard. Um, I hope that you will be looking at the special ed reimbursements. Uh, as you know, this is critically underfunded. In Hoyoke, we are reimbursed at about 5% for special needs. We have over 26% special needs, so we already start the year drastically underfunded under that. Homelessness should not be part. Uh, homelessness should be part of the foundation review uh, in how cities are funded uh, instead of being a reimbursement. Because um, we all know, unfortunately, even as we've talked about as transportation, we at the state level don't fully fund our reimbursement rates. So uh, hom homelessness and special ed should definitely be part of the population. As you know, it's going to cost more to educate a child who's homeless in special ed uh, than the average student, no matter what their income level. Uh, the main thing, uh, and a lot of the stuff you've heard today I know is out of your purview as far as the need for more arts. I'd like to have more arts in our schools across the district, across the Commonwealth. But one critical thing I think that you can look at that um, might be a quote unquote easier fix. Currently right now the, uh, the, the base student uh, payment per year is paid in one lump sum after a census is done in September. Schools get that payment in October for the year. Uh, what happens between then uh, and the rest of the school year is school choice. Uh, there is often an exodus out of charter schools back into our public schools. Uh, people move within district or out of district and none of that money follows them. So a student or a school gets that full funding in September for the entire year and the students leave. There should be two payments, I think a September and a February March payment. That way a second census can be done. So if a student transfers, whether it's within district to another district through school choice, in or out of a charter school, some of that money should follow them. It's not fair to any school district to take on the full funding of a school, of a student that transfers halfway through. I think that could be a quote unquote easy adjustment that could be looked at to have two censuses done and two payments of that foundation budget. So um, I thank you again for your time. I will be presenting written testimony and I thank everyone for their patience. Thank you. Thanks, Representative. Before you go, just want to check if there are questions um, from the commission. Yes. Um, not looking for a long answer about this, but it's it's intriguing your your statement about including homeless edu education costs of homeless students. Um, so thinking it, this can be something that you could submit to mm -hmm. fellow colleagues later, but 
talking with John, my colleague John here, how would you propose to account for that in the foundation budget, the cost of homeless students? We can definitely look at that. We have some thoughts, and I would definitely present them. I've worked with my school committee, and uh, uh, obviously the students that are being moved around the state uh, should not be reimbursed, but students that are homeless in our district and will be staying in the district for the school year, there should be uh, a way to figure that into the foundation. We'll be submitting some ideas. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you again, Representative Vega. And I was remiss, I did not check for questions after um, Ms. De Jesus and Nani um, finished their testimony. Were there any questions for them? Okay. In that case, I'm going to move on to the next person on the list, which is uh, Matthew Cunningham. I'm sorry, I can't read the very... Sorry, it's Cook. And Cook. Um, hi, my name is Matthew Cunningham Cook. Uh, I am an investigative uh, financial journalist who lives in Holyoke. I am also a member of UAW Local 2322. Uh, I have a few points I'd like to make. Uh, number one, it's worth pointing out the class and racial demographics of this room. Take a look around. This is not what a cross-section of Western Mass looks like. And Senator Chang Diaz, Diaz, you know, Max Weber, you know, wrote this excellent essay, you know, called Bureaucracy as a Vocation, you know, which is, he's basically talking about how, you know, bureaucrats act like they passively enforce rules, when in fact, rules need to be reiterated at every single point that they are. You could have let Viviana, the only parent who is not an elected official, speak more, but you did not, and shame on you. So, um, two, so by focusing on the formula as opposed to proposing a dramatic increase to the size of the foundation budget, this commission is engaging in a dangerous politics of austerity. Massachusetts has the money to fund high quality public education for all of our kids with black studies, Latino, Latina studies, art, music, bilingual and foreign languages, librarians, social workers, and school nurses. Massachusetts is the wealthiest big state in the country. There are many rich people who pay little ta in taxes in this state and as a result can pay more. So I want to echo my sister Viviana de Jesus's call for a significant increase in our state's only progressive tax, the tax on investment income or capital gains. Massachusetts is the second most unequal state in the nation. Uh, um, just as a FYI. Uh, so an increase in the investment income tax to 28%, which at about 47% or so as a combined state or federal rate is well below other historical epochs, would, um, uh, would, re would both reduce income inequality and create four, $4 billion more for, to fund our schools. This is the only option that will fulfill the state's mission to educate all our children equitably. Nani just spoke to you about the under, how underfunding affects her education. The real solution is not to reshift a, a shrinking pot, not to pit urban districts against rural districts, as Representative Vega said. We need a bigger pot. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Cunningham Cook? Seeing none, I'm going to take liberty and let you know, Mr. Cook. Well, I think the record will reflect that it did give extra time to Ms. De Jesus. I agree with very much of what she said, and it was you know, difficult for me personally to ask her to limit herself. I hope that we will hear from you both when it comes to hearings before the Committee on Revenue, um, which is the Committee under, of Jurisdiction for some of the tax issues that you're talking about, and I'm inclined to agree with you on. It is not the charge of this commission. Thank you again. Um, we're gonna move on to the next person uh, on the list, which is Je Jeff Singleton. I'm a former member of the Montague Finance Committee, a uh, former member of the Gil Montague School Committee. I have a statement that was passed last spring by the uh, Gil Montague Regional School Committee, by the Montague uh, Finance Committee and the Montague um, uh, Select Board. And I'll submit that and I'll just quickly uh, say what I take to be the central argument and the central point of that statement is, or the central question. And the question essentially is, um, if you phase in a more adequate foundation budget, given the realities of this formula, will school districts actually get more money when the numbers come out the other side? And I think that's a legitimate question to ask, although it's a little bit beyond the scope of, 
of, I think, the, the, the issues you've been dealing with, but it seems to me it's a legitimate implementation question. Will it matter to do that? And I would suggest to you that there's strong evidence that for most districts it may not make much difference. Um, if you uh, take a look at uh, FY 2007, 2008, and 2009, in those three years it had very high inflation factors on the foundation budget. They were four and five percent. In each of those years, two-thirds of the districts in the state did not receive Chapter 70 increases under the core formula. In other words, you had high inflation factors, but when the numbers came out the other side, the districts actually got flat Chapter 70. Um, last year, um, I believe over 30% of the districts, over nearly 70% of the districts in the state had flat Chapter 70. The question is, why is that happening? I have a hypothesis. I believe it's the way enrollment works its way into the formula. In essence, the foundation budget exaggerates the impact of enrollment on annual changes in the foundation budget. It assumes that if you are spending $10,000 a student as a rough estimate, and you lose 10 students, then your foundation budget is $100,000 lower than it would have been otherwise. You then subtract a minimum contribution that has virtually no enrollment variable, but that just keeps going up and up and up. In my view, the basic math there leads to flat chapter 70 for the majority of districts. And I'm not convinced that, um, that implementing or phasing in over a five, six, seven year period uh, a more adequate foundation budget will actually mean more money for actual districts. I know it's very easy to say, let's fix this part of the foundation budget, or you know, let's uh, 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 have a better inflation factor. I agree with all those arguments. I think they're right. I think it's a very strong argument that the foundation budget has not been kept up with inflation. But I think it's. A, I think that the other issues with the formula are so extreme that not much is going to happen. I and mean, we've had flat Chapter 70 in the Gil Montague district actually has gone down since 2002. Virtually every school district in Franklin and Hampshire County has gone down since 2002. Somerville has gone down since 2002, despite the fact that the foundation budget has gone up by about 40% during that period. So I guess what I would urge you to do is two things. One is if it's outside the purview of your, this is partially an enrollment issue, which is what uh, was asked, but I would urge you, at least in your final report, to urge the state to take a broader look at the, at the formula itself. It's been around this way for 20 years, and I think it needs a second look. And secondly, I would urge you to um, get the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to actually calculate what a phased-in foundation budget uh, increase would actually do when the Chapter 70 numbers came out the other side, which I think they're capable of doing. Are there any questions? Hmm. Thank you again for your testimony. Quick, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Tom. Um, thank you for your thoughtful testimony, and clearly you've spent a lot of time looking at the formula and its, its mechanisms. You made reference to that we're looking at inflation, or we're looking at, you're inferring things around the edges, and that there are more important things driving this. And so I'm just curious what you think those those key elements that are driving things that need to be addressed. Well, I have a personal view that's sort of outside the the statements that, that I'm sort of representing. Um, uh, the main issue, it seems to me, is the enrollment issue, that you have a foundation budget that exaggerates annual increases in enrollment and decreases in enrollment. Um, and then you subtract a minimum contribution that has almost no enrollment variable at all. And the inevitable result for most districts, which are declining enrollment districts, and it's not just out here, is that you get flat to declining Chapter 70. Then what happens is the state holds people harmless or puts a wrinkle into the formula so that everybody gets something. But what that always means is last year's Chapter 70 always covers what your, the formula says you should get this year. So you just have all these districts, I mean, an incredible number of districts that have so I think it's an, for me, I believe it's an enrollment. I think it needs more investigation. I don't have the computer to do, actually do it, but I think it's primarily, I mean, do you want me to be honest? In, in, a, in an honest sense, I believe that the Chapter 74 formula is a brilliant device for measuring adequacy and equity as far as the distribution of a theoretical amount of Chapter 70. Um, it has a tremendous amount of internal logic and internal consistency. I don't think it actually works in the real world when you actually do the math. I think it's an example of a policy that produces unintended consequences when you actually do the math. 
that's sort of where I come from in a policy sense. And I, I also want to say I'm a parent. My son graduated from Turner's Falls High School about a year and a half ago. So, so thank, I don't know whether that you. helps. I don't know whether that's an answer. Could it's around enrollment. I mean, that's what I heard. Yeah. Is, how do you? Uh, how do I, th I think I think the formula has a serious problem with regard how enrollment enters into it. And there's a number of things you could do to it. One of which would be to have a more realistic enrollment variable included in the annual changes in the uh, in the uh, in the um, in the foundation budget uh, that really reflects what changes in enrollment actually do. You could probably do that. Um, you could put enrollment into the minimum contribution. The group of us that looked at this at the Gil Montague District were very divided over that question, whether we, the, the minimum contribution should have an enrollment factor. So, I mean, I, I can't say I have all the, the answers. Thank you again for your testimony. Yeah, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Thank you, sir. Um, I would echo, it's clear you spent a lot of time with the formula and we really appreciate that level of depth. Um, Mike Naughton, uh, also of Montague Finance Committee. Thank you very much. I'll, tr I'll try to be brief. I appreciate you coming out here and spending the time to try to hear everyone. Um, I am on the Montague Finance Committee and I have for several years also been uh, very involved in working with our local school district, the Gil Montague School District, to uh, find solutions to some of its challenges. Um, I'd like to echo, I agree with a lot of what's been said already, I won't repeat it. Um, I'd like to focus uh, particularly on uh, an issue which has been raised by several people, which is the special challenges raised by rural, uh, raised for rural school systems and, and districts. And I thought I'd offer a little historical perspective by uh, reading from a letter that I found looking through my files from 11 years ago, January 2004, uh, written to the Joint Committee on Education, Arts and Humanities by uh, Stanley Rosenberg. Uh, is he still around? Sorry. <laughs> um, he, he does a great job. We're very proud of him. Uh, in this letter, where he covered a number of points, um, he said at one point, many people in rural regional school districts have long believed that the foundation budget does not accurately reflect the cost of educating children over a broad, sparsely populated geographic area. The problems of scale and the higher average costs associated with running schools in a rural setting have never been taken into consideration by the state funding formula. That was true then, it's true now. You've heard that from various people and I won't repeat what they've said. Um, I agree with all of it. Um, I would like to offer a, uh, a possible at least uh, avenue towards a solution, if, if not a solution, which would be to uh, change the formula so it doesn't depend so much, as some, as some people have said, about on enrollment figures. The way the, enroll, the formula works now, uh, it assumes that if you've got a district of a thousand <coughs> students, it's going to cost half as much to run as a district with 2,000 students given the same uh, demographics and so on. Um, that's ridiculous. No, it's not. Um, I think if the formula were split into two components, one of which recognized the fact that in order to have a district of any size, you need a certain infrastructure. If you're going to have a district of K through 12, you're going to need a certain number of teachers. You're going to need a principal. You're going to need a superintendent. You're going to need a number of support staff. That number is not going to change. It may go up as the population goes up, but it doesn't go down below a certain point as the population decreases. And if you split out that and then added on a component for enrollment to, to recognize the fact that a school of 20,000 does cost more than a school of 1,000, um, I think you might come a lot closer to solving some of the problems that rural districts face. And I'll, I know you want to keep this short, so I'll leave it right there. Thank you. I have not submitted anything in writing, but I, I plan to and would be happy to work with anyone to, to flesh out these ideas. But it's something that hasn't been mentioned before, and I think it's 
I don't think any solution that assumes that simple changes in population are reflected in how much it costs to run a district is going to work. I think you have to recognize. And I think part of the, the problem, as you've heard from other people with rural districts, is you, ha you need to have a certain number of school buildings. We have a two-town district. We have an elementary school in each town. It would be politically impossible to consolidate those into one school. There are also physical challenges in terms of buildings. We have two elementary schools in the larger town. They, we wanted to consolidate it into one, but the one that is, has facilities for the smaller kids isn't big enough for everybody, and the one that is big enough for everybody has no facilities for the smaller kids. It would have cost more money than we have to change. So we aren't able. We need those two schools, and we have a newly renovated middle school, high school, paid for largely by the SBA, which is wonderful. But we have four schools, and we don't see any way to reduce that. We had five, we closed one. It was in a rural part of the district, and we have a rural urban demography in our district, and a number of parents choice their kids out rather than send them to the school that attracted more of the urban population. And that's, that's, a rea that's another reality that we face, is you can, you can try to consolidate schools, but the parents don't always go along with it. So Thank you. That's it. Any questions? Yes, Colin? Just a comment, um, and probably directed at the previous speaker, too. One of the things that we run into, and, uh, and I'm not a legislator, is that in order to get bills passed, you have to get a majority of votes. And, and oftentimes, that entails holding certain people harmless so that you can get the vote to get the whole package. So it, it, it makes it very, very difficult. And, and I think that uh, the, uh, it, it's, it's something that we find all the time that sometimes the thing that might be the most just is not necessarily going to be the thing that can be passed. And, and it creates a great deal of difficulty, but oftentimes it's, you know, it's a, 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 a the perfect is the enemy of the good, and, and if you, if you, you don't want to be left with nothing, you know. But, and I think especially the previous speaker, you know, that idea that is, I think it's very, very important to understand that in uh, even the committee might come down with our recommendations, but they're not necessarily going to be adopted uh, specifically or in whole by the whole legislature. And, and I think that's why it's important for people to have good contact with their own senator or representative and relate either themselves or by in their particular group of constituents, whether it's rural or what, what the needs are for, for their particular group. Our senators and representatives have been very involved in our process. And I, I hear what you're saying. One of the challenges of being from a sparsely populated area is we don't have a lot of votes in Boston. Yeah. But on the other hand, if you're not solving the problem, you're not solving the problem. Well, Maybe you you're passing something, but certainly you're appreciate not your, the problem. your your input. Thank you. Tom, I can't help but um, on co following up on Coley's comment, I just he was explaining the challenges that legislators such as yourself, Madam Chair, need to face after this commission's done. But it was interesting that um, the gentleman testified about the political challenges that his two communities were facing with regard to what policy to pursue and what was politically feasible. On both sides of that, it was surfacing. I found that interesting. Uh, the next person we have signed up is uh, John Howold, also M Montague Finance Committee. Mr. Howold, if I can urge you to, you know, uh, if you can just say ditto to anything that's been said already that you agree with to help us streamline time. Oh, good. yeah. I intend to use a minute at the most. Okay. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, I would like to uh, remind, I guess, the members of the commission that I'm, I'm hoping as a taxpayer, as a resident, and so forth, that the recommendations you make are made based on the testimony you receive and the value of that testimony rather than whether you think it will be politically acceptable in Boston. Secondly, since I don't want to repeat what I think the two prior speakers uh, offered, which was acknowledged as being excellent testimony. Um, there are probably three points that I would recommend 
um, you pay attention to. One of them is recognize what I recur, uh, refer to in my prior life as the non-recurring engineering. This is the infrastructure part. It's the same everywhere. The second thing is you recognize uh, the changes over the last 20 years in the uh, mandates that have come out of uh, Boston or Malden so that um, what is appropriated by the legislature under ch Chapter 70 has some fit with what comes out of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education so that there is some kind of um, synergy between the two. And finally, the, what I think has been referred to as wraparound costs. The expectations that uh, the Commonwealth has that non-core uh, educational needs have to be um, addressed. These are some of the social issues, um, economic issues. Um, if this is a mandate um, and a public value, then we have to be willing uh, to fund that. Somewhere in the formula, there ought to be recognition of it. I recognize that when the formula is um, recreated, it will not solve everyone's um, needs in education, but it will be a credible, um, uh, a credible response to a need, and a credible response will improve the acceptance across the state of what the legislature is doing and what the Department of Education is doing. There needs to be a a greater sense of confidence in the public figures that what they say is what will be reflected in what they do. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Howland? <coughs> See none, thank you and again. One small thing, it's, um, this happens a lot, it's H-A-N-O-L-D, I think. Oh, okay, thank you. Handled. In the unlikely event that someone wants to get in touch with me yep. again. No, that's very helpful. <laughs> that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, next on our list is Gianna Allentuck. Uh, as she makes her way forward, I just want to uh, underscore something that Linda Noonan, one of our commissioners, said earlier, uh, which is that there are four charges that we're responsible for responding to as a commission, and there are two, the latter two, uh, on your handouts that we haven't heard much testimony on here and in previous uh, hearings. Look, we're looking for measures to ensure that resources are effectively utilized and suggestions about models of efficient and effective resource allocation. So I just want to draw out that those are fields, you know, really wide open for you to influence the thinking and the work of, of this commission. So I encourage you, if you do have any ideas and feedback for us on those two counts, to please make sure not to bury it. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, with that set up, now I'm going to try and figure out how I can, <laughs> I'll try and work it in there somehow. Okay, thanks. Uh, but again, my name is Gianna Allentuck, and I am the counselor for Brookings School in Springfield, Massachusetts, also an active uh, volunteer in the community and a parent of two uh, children of public school age. Brookings is 97% 90, poverty and was just recently identified as one of 20 of the poorest schools in the state of Massachusetts. We've been level four for the past four years and we are exiting level four this year, so um, due to some, some great work on the part of our educators and students and families in our building. So, Senator, I will say ditto to what most of my Springfield leaders did share, but I just wanted to add one last um, deficit that uh, I haven't heard mentioned here today and my Springfield leaders didn't mention as well, um, and that is that a large part of society uh, lacks the understanding and appreciation for education as the foundation for life. Uh, and most people who are not in education and who don't have children in the public schools uh, don't value the uh, provision of an excellent education and also often only speak of our failings. So I'm not asking for money from you today, but I am asking you to use your voice in your conversations and discussions beyond this committee to raise up as a, uh, education as the means for resolving the issues that society does care about and not as the reason for those problems. And in doing so, I think if you further that understanding on society's part, you will make all of our lives easier and your proceedings here. Uh, that can be uh, an effective measure of solving the budget problems for this, this commission will be to raise up education in your other worlds. So thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions for Ms. Allen Tuck? Seeing none, thank you again. Um, Catherine Kay. Catherine Kay is still here. I'm going to move on, but if anyone knows her and she just is in the bathroom, you know, let her know to make herself know when she comes back. Um, Anne Hennessy. Uh, 
Hello, thank you very much. Um, I'm a Northampton School Committee member and a Chicopee public school teacher and supervisor and a parent of two elementary school students. And I'm actually just gonna speak as the role of a parent because um, it's easier not to be a parent but to speak as a parent. Um, first of all, I guess I, I feel like we're fighting over crumbs of an incredibly small pie and that's what it sounds like here. Um, as a parent, I'm just gonna say a few things I see um, and that I have trouble with, aside from the fact that I love the public school my kids attend. The first is, um, I see no vice principals in elementary schools anymore who could give invaluable feedback to teachers who are al already doing um, invaluable work. I see a wait list to an incredible reading program that my daughter uses, um, who I would love my son to use, but we don't have enough licenses for. I see my um, kids taking PE twice a day, or twice a week. I see absolutely no librarians, and we've heard from someone prior to this and how important um, librarians are um, to literacy. I see no musical instrument instruction, no foreign languages, and as a result of that, I see many, many, many parents with significant, and I will underline the significant means, choosing to send their children to charter schools who offer um, arts programs or foreign language programs. I see PTOs in our school, here in Northampton, in our schools, funding accessible playgrounds, field trips, cultural events, speakers, art supplies, um, and donating time and fundraising, and I've cut hundreds of bo box tops myself for this. Um, I see fewer teachers, and those who are here are succeeding despite the many unfunded mandates. Um, and I see students taking way too many high-stakes tests. I don't know how much they cost, I'd love to know that. So I have three things that I would love. Um, one is change the formula to take into account the reality of our demographics, specifically ELL, specifically special, edu special education, and the costs of healthcare. Um, the second is if you can help send the message that we need a bigger pie, period. Um, well, not period, we need to help students succeed. And then the third thing is we need to redefine what adequate means, as someone said prior to this. Um, it needs to be excellent, and we need to do that. Um, because we need to take radical action to uproot um, the economic and racial injustice that exists. And I think that's about democracy. So that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Before you go, could you just say again which, um, which town you're a resident in? I'm a resident in Northampton. Northampton. Okay, yep. thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Senator Jalen. Well, I think you may have hit on one in inefficiency, which is I think Congress is going to offer us the opportunity, may offer us the opportunity not to have annual testing. That would and be a great could, efficiency issue, yes. If people could give us some idea of how much time and money um, both state mandated, federal mandated, and locally mandated tests are costing. That, you know, I'll time tell you, is money also. Time so. is money, and I will tell you as a teacher now, not as a parent or as a school committee member, um, in the 18 plus years I've been a teacher, I cannot believe the increase in time we spend on, on testing, on, on not teaching because we're testing, on not teaching because kids miss the testing and have to make up the tests. And the high stakes nature of the test, I think, is what's criminal for our students. So I, I, I implore you to look at that. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you again. Um, Jay Barry who is with one of the regional school districts. I can't quite make it out. Good afternoon. I'm superintendent of South Tall and Granville Regional. It's a three-town regional with about 1,700 students. I just want to go through quickly some uh, comments, many of which are structured by the DESE uh, report written in 2013 on Chapter 70. Can you tilt that up? Yeah, many of these comments are structured by the uh, DESE uh, document that was written about Chapter 70 in 2013. First, um, although it's technically outside the foundation situation, the circuit breaker is a very important uh, part of state aid. If that can, in a minimal sense, be, be sustained and in an optimal sense be enhanced, it would be great. Um, the foundation reserve money seems to have gone dormant in recent years. We used to call them pothole grants. It's not big money. It's tremendously helpful. Uh, and I think the department did a really good job administering those as well. When I was a superintendent in a far more rural district, it sometimes meant the difference between finishing the year without a deficit. Um, to consider, many people have mentioned this, the special education assumptions in the foundation budget, and also maybe to give some thought to how well the FTE concept 
captures costs that are incurred by districts that practice inclusion. Uh, that those kind that kind of support is not written into ed plans in many cases. Uh, we spend a lot of money on paraprofessional support, uh, and I'm not sure that the FTE concept captures that. Um, I support the aggregate wealth model and the target share. Two of our three towns do not meet target share, and the requirement that they do so and the penalties that are involved, I think, are useful in helping them get there and also giving us a little more revenue. Maybe a fresh look at the 49, 41-59 split that it's, that's at the bottom of that concept. Uh, that's about, what, eight years old by now, seven years old. Um, <clears throat> Basically, the other reason the target share is so important is because minimum contribution and the target share requirement really define what our local contribution is from our member towns. They support schools, but they're very fiscally conservative. Um, health insurance and benefits, uh, the paper identifies this as one of the biggest discrepancies between foundation and actual spending. It's probably, I think, one of your more challenging tasks. Um, and uh, my only suggestion is that if it can be increased, it would be very helpful, and perhaps it needs to be, any kind of increase needs to be linked to implementation of the Municipal Health Reform Act. Um, to revise assumptions about infrastructure and end user technology costs in districts, that's not going away, it's only gonna go up. Um, and also that maybe the foundation assumptions should include something about uh, what districts are required to do relative to data management and data reporting uh, that are mandated by the department. Uh, that's just, in my opinion, I've been a superintendent for 15 years. The data requirements that have just ballooned in the last six or seven years. We have to, we have to hire a full-time person to do this next year. Um, the paper made a comment about embedded professional development. I think that's money well spent. I think in some cases it's more expensive than the one-shot kind of old-fashioned PD that we used to do, but I think it is a good practice uh, and one that we um, have adopted. I would support lifting the preschool enrollment cap. And in terms of resource allocation, uh, the suggestion I have is about the department perhaps making programs or applications available to school districts so that they can do their own studies about how efficient they're allocating their resources. The state of Vermont has such a program. There are others out there, and it would meet, save some time in terms of districts trying to reinvent the wheel uh, to do their own analysis. So good luck with a very difficult task. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions? I do have a quick one. Well, what I hope will be a quick one. Um, on the data um, collection and reporting uh, issue, is there anything um, th that you can envision that could be done to make that a less uh, burdensome, you know, without, and I, I hear your point about you know, being open to reduce the actual reporting requirements, but short of that, <clears throat> procedurally, is there any, you know, is it a matter of, it's a lot of, you know, 20th century paperwork shuffling, or, you know, if, if it were an actual, a more centralized data entry system, would it be, any, is there anything that you can imagine along those lines that would make that e burden easier? I, I think that it's, I think it's been a challenging uh, issue on all sides of the table. Uh, the department has, I think, tried to make this easier with the implementation of the uh, interoperability framework where you automatically do uploads to the state, but that has not unfolded in a really efficient way. So it's, it's a challenge, and it, it does mean manpower and time. So it's, it's just something, it's another cost we're incurring around uh, things that are required. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Aldo Petronio, Brockton Public Schools. Thank you, Senator Chang Diaz, Representative Paish and Committee. Um, thank you for calling me up to the mic again. I've been out here a few times now. Much of what I've been wanted to talk about has been said, and I would ha have to say that I think Springfield did an excellent, excellent job of identifying the subject that I wanted to speak of, which is the low-income uh, students that we have. I feel that 
Um, the low-income students uh, also encompass many of the other categories within the formula. Um, um, I think they overlap each other. So I would think that if there's a way that you could uh, revise and look at how you fund in the formula the low-income students to provide more funding to them, I think that trickles down to the ELLs, the SPEDs, the uh, other areas within the formula, um, in turn helping capture that. One of the problems I see, uh, from, from Brockton anyways, is that with those students, a lot of uh, statistics and data is gathered from the national census, and many of those people who fall in that category avoid the census. So I think a, a better measurement on our end is we always go to and refer to our free and reduced lunch count. We find that in those communities, we have special individuals within the school system that reach out to those families, that work with them because they're afraid of anyone from the government that works with them. And because of all that, I think when it comes to everything from uh, the formula to um, IDEA to, um, 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 to other federal programs, that we lose out in those areas, yet we still have those, those children to educate. So um, you know, the, along with that, um, when you have a higher incidence of low-income uh, families, you also, um, in areas like Brockton, I assume Springfield also, you have higher incidence of um, uh, crime and poverty in those areas. We have uh, a special connection with our police department. Um, these students who live in this environment are uh, usually subject to what we call a traumatized children's group. And uh, during each day, as things happen within those families, the local police uh, connect with our guidance counselors, our, our guidance staff. Any child that's been exposed to any of that, um, their name is given to our counselors who then, during the day, go and reach out to those children. You know, they've witnessed domestic violence, they've witnessed um, you know, crime, they've witnessed um, parents being arrested, they've, they've witnessed murder. Um, and those students require additional services. They, 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 um, part of our wraparound program is them. And I think you find that, again, with the low income, the higher instance of that comes around, and those students require additional uh, assistance and help. Um, and with that, I'll wrap it up, because I know we're on a time constraint. Thank you. Oh, I will say the one thing that, um, I like, uh, I've been to all of these hearings, and Dr. Provost, the superintendent of Northampton, um, made a m mention about following the GIC for health insurance. I think that's a great suggestion because we all struggle with certain costs, one of, you know, which is salaries. The second one is the cost of health insurance. Um, if something can be done to tie into the GIC, I think that's a level playing field for all of us to have to follow, especially since the state has asked us to um, either model our plans or follow their plan. I think that's a great um, topic. Thank you. Thank you. Tom? Just a quick point of information question. Was it your understanding that the census, U.S. Census was used for the low-income headcount in Chapter 70? No, not in Chapter okay. 70. I, I, I'm drawing a blank. It's used in Title I. Okay. Right, because so, it is free and reduced, it has historically been from free and free reduced. reduced. Yes, but it's the, it's it's Title One and many of other grants that we apply for. Um, that comes in. But thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bertonio, and um, thank you for your commitment to traversing the state with us uh, to do this work. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I miss a question? Quick question. Uh, we've heard from many speakers over all three uh, uh, sessions about health insurance, health insurance, and you've come up with a suggestion somehow tying it into GIC. It was amused. Um, and that, okay, but th that's one of the suggestions. And the other question is, I don't know if you have a, uh, an opinion on this. Uh, many school districts obviously have different rates of uh, reimbursement for their employees. How do you, how do you uh, create a level playing field? And if you can, uh, tell us what you think is reasonable. I, I have been across the state to everything from MASBO meetings to you know state revenue hearings and such, and what I've seen is about 75-25. I know there are still some districts that do 90-10. I don't know how they survive, but um, I know there have been districts at 80-20, and most of them have moved. But I think 75-25 is where most cities and towns are on that, and maybe you'd base it off of you know, that. I've, I haven't seen any greater than that, but I think you would base off of that. And if someone decides to do 90-10, then they pick up the difference themselves. Thank you. So uh, so just out of curiosity, Aldo, what's what's Brockton's share? 75-25. Mm -hmm. 
Any further questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, Lori Farkas, Northampton Public Schools. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm going to cut out a lot of my introductions and um, just say that I've been either a principal or special education director in the state for the last 28 years. And I'm just going to cut to the point so I can add a couple of extra ones that um, people have referred to in their questions. Um, transportation costs for special education students going to out of district placements has soared. For a number of years, there have been conversations about including percentages of these costs as part of the circuit breaker formula, but this has not happened. While there have been efforts by the Department of Ed to explore other lower cost options for this service, our out of district um, transportation costs amount to more than half a million dollars, with only 40 students in out of district placements. Recent changes in disciplinary regulations and laws have also significantly impacted our budget. While we are not a district that has historically used suspension or expulsion to excess, and disallowing these measures except in more extreme circumstances, and requiring that all students, both regular and special education, continue to receive educational services from certified faculty members while engaged in disciplinary actions, has resulted in the need for us to hire three additional faculty expressly for this purpose. While the intentions of the new regulatory language are to be applauded, compliance with this mandate has had a significant fiscal impact. As a Western Massachusetts educator, the districts in which I have worked have all been low incidence with regard to the number of English language learners. While all of the districts have worked to serve ELL students to the best of their ability, <coughs> and the directed directives and guidelines that frame the education of ELL students in Massachusetts have been a catalyst for greater depth of training and better instruction for our ELL learners, the challenging face of our student bodies have resulted in the need for more, the changing face of our student bodies have resulted in the need for more educators with training specific to ELLs. This need in districts with an ELL population of less than 100 has been largely unfunded. Um, <clears throat> a couple other things that people referred to in questions. Um, when you look at the funding for special education and the, the idea or the concept that full funding is 75% and it's based on um, the services that students receive largely as pullout services, this really flies in the face of our mandate to do inclusion. And inclusion has an kind of contrary and in response to um, a letter or a, a, an advisory written by Marty Mitnack recently um, has resulted in a, a significantly higher number of paraprofessionals being hired in districts throughout the state. In particular, our district spends about two and a half million dollars in paraprofessional salaries. Can I say one other thing? Medic <laughs> The, um, the reimbursement, someone asked about um, insurance and reimbursement through for some of those services through insurance. The restrictions regarding Medicaid reimbursement have skyrocketed. The, the way the management of reimbursement is complex, time consuming, and results in a significantly reduced amount of reimbursement based on their formulas. And we are not allowed in, in meetings to ask families to provide their insurance for any of those services. They can offer for some evaluations, but we are not allowed to ask for that. So there was a question about asking families about that, and <coughs> that is disallowed. Um, and finally, um, the complexity of needs that we see in our, in our buildings has changed vastly, and I'm an old person in near retirement, but um, in the years that I've been seeing students, just because of the, the greater level of sophistication of our medical services. So we're seeing students where before they might not have survived infancy or, or early childhood, and those students are in our schools and require, as some one person referred to, feeding tubes, um, ongoing medical monitoring throughout the day, and those are additional costs that we incur. There are some buildings that I've been in that have two full-time nurses for 500 students because of the level of medical needs in the building. 
Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, too. Um, I have one question. I'm just going to check with other commission members. Um, thank you for your attentiveness and responsiveness to the questions we've been asking. That's really helpful. So just to dig a little bit on the um, health care reimbursement question, the, um, the prohibition that you're working under from asking families about their uh, medical insurance, can you say anything about the, what the genesis of that is? What it's, the it's in the regs. I, I can't cite, I mean, I've been sitting here, um, but I can't cite the specific uh, the, area in, in the regs. That's fine, and we can certainly look that up. And, and if you don't know the answer to this, we can certainly track it down. But I'm just wondering if you know what the logic of that was. Is it? Well, you can't, you can't impact a family's ability to serve their own medical needs by their own design. So, um, so for instance, even the, the Medicaid permission slip, our ability to, um, to report med services for reimbursement for Medicaid used to be a passive um, permission slip, and now it has to be an active permission slip. So a family has to actively say when they get a letter from us, um, we will allow you to report X XYZ services that my child's receiving to Medicaid. And the fear of the families, even though we reassure them in the letter and uh, lots of other ways, is that that will impact their ability to access um, services or reach their capacity for services. Or I'm not sure I fully, I don't know that anyone fully understands Medicaid. But um, uh, so, so just in terms of their personal insurance, it's the same kind of um, situation. And sorry, am I understanding right that that you are prohibited from asking families at all what are they insured? What kind of insurance do they carry? Well, no. So if I'm sitting at a meeting and um, a family requests an, a certain type of evaluation for their child, um, I can't say, "Can you use your insurance to pay for that?" I see. Okay. If they offer, okay, <laughs> it's mm. different. Gotcha. Thank you. Any, Any other, other questions? Seeing none, thank you again okay, for your okay. testimony. Um, Derek Mason. Good afternoon. My name is Derek Mason. I serve the town of Russell on its finance committee. Uh, GTAC, the Gateway Towns Advisory Committee, and JLBA, uh, the Jacobs Ladder Business Association, all within the Gateway Regional School District. Uh, thank you for taking our statements today. I follow in the uh, footsteps and stand in the shadow of some very eloquent speakers here today, including our student uh, Casey Pease. I think he may have left already to run some errands. <coughs> Uh, as you know, our Gateway Regional School District is in the throes of a crisis because one town does not like the foundation budget formula, does not like the fact that they are the highest per capita taxpaying town in our system, and because they lost one of our three elementary schools or, or were being forced to close their elementary school. Uh, as a cost saving factor, I would just like to note that uh, in spite of the closure of these elementary schools, we are still being effectively penalized by MSBA uh, for repayment of, of those funds. <clears throat> Historically, uh, Massachusetts has had a world-class reputation for education, and we really can't afford to lose this. Um, we know that the foundation formula from 1993 is outdated. It needs to be reworked. And we should probably be doing this every five or 10 years anyways. Uh, we need to include in uh, an improved formula the changeable economic factors that impact local taxpayers and town revenues in ways that are fair and adjustable, transparent and easily understandable. I won't belabor the details of, of some of the factors that should be included in that uh, formula, um, but it would be great if revising this formula alone was the answer. Our problems do go far beyond this. Western and rural parts of Massachusetts struggle with different issues than the Boston metro region. Out here we have declining populations, decreasing school enrollments, deteriorating economies of scale, 
scanty and more expensive transportation systems, less political clout, poor internet services, less functional town governments. We also need compensation for the many broken promises uh, almost every year that we suffer, especially local aid and aid for transportation. We need to revision our state's educational system, reform fee structures and state aid for education, including student transportation, voc ed, school choice, and unfunded mandates. Any of these corrections at the state level could have prevented our local crisis. And we need to be consolidating, not downsizing regional school districts like ours in order to get better economies of scale. We need you, our legislators, our secretary, our commissioner, and your staffs to work together to work with us, parents, teachers, taxpayers, and towns, proactively and constructively to solve these many issues. We appreciate your, commission, your commitment to this ongoing and consuming process. We stand ready to work with you at the state level and with anyone who can help us achieve some positive solutions here. Thank you very much. Thank you, too. Um, any questions for Mr. Mason? No. Thank, Thank you again. You. Uh, this brings us to Tom Jordan from Northampton. Hi. Hi. Thank you for the hustle. <laughs> so uh, my name is Tom Jordan. I live here in Northampton. I have three daughters in the schools here. Um, I'm a member of the Public Schools Action Coalition. We're a committed group of uh, parents and professionals in town who are passionate about helping to create public schools our kids can thrive in. Um, I'm going to try to read through my heavily marked up notes. Um, you might have not noticed Governor Baker calling for a lifting of the cap of the public of the charter school enrollment um, in the Thursday, uh, his Thursday inaugural address. Um, the governor also uh, reminisced about times when he was a student and how awesome the schools here in the Commonwealth were, and we look for a way to get the schools back to that uh, level of awesomeness. It may be beyond the charge of this commission. Um, the question of charter schools looms large for us as a community and for other communities. Um, there should be some reflection of the, of the effect that charter schools have in the foundation budget formula. Additionally, there are people here in the room who have a, a voice in the debate, I'm looking at our representatives and senators, uh, have a voice in the debate about lifting the, chat, the, the, the cap on charter schools. Um, and we, we, we would say as a coalition of parents that we strongly oppose lifting that cap. Additionally, we urge you to increase the support for schools like ours here in Northampton. One simple way to do this is to restore the equity and the balancing in the funding formula, and we appreciate that you guys are working or have that task in front of you. Uh, others have said today that, that uh, increased costs for special ed have, uh, have uh, made the current formula outdated in its 22-year history. Uh, uh, additional costs, as Dr. Provo said, for uh, health care for uh, employees. And our mayor said, he's now left, I'm pointing to his empty chair, uh, we, send, we send to the charter schools more money per student than we receive from Chapter 70 funding uh, for those charter school students. Uh, and that, that inequity is breaking our bank. Um, um, Governor Baker attended very different schools than our children are attending. The PTOs in his day were more than just fundraisers. Our PTOs serve as sources of revenue for schools, field trips, science classroom materials, other so-called extras, new library books, robotics classes. These are all things that, are, that, that PTOs are paying for and that the schools just don't have the budget to take care of. Um, so we ask you to, to take a look at the, the effect of the charter school uh, on our budgets and how the foundation formula can, can offset that effect in some ways. We ask you to take a look at the inequities that are inherent in the current formulation. We ask you to do those two things. Um, but don't do them to increase, to increase test scores. Don't do that. Do it to help our schools to become more like the schools that the governor attended, like the schools that we attended. Two more sentences. Do this so the professionals in our schools can inspire our kids. Kids will thrive when they benefit from a day filled with the wonder of scientific discovery. 
the beauty of a simple clay pot or the joy of music. They will be inspired by the elegance of mathematics, the study of a language, and the persuasive power of the written word. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Mr. Jordan. Questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you again. Thank you. Nancy Cheevers. Good afternoon. My name is Nancy Cheevers, and I'm the Director of Curriculum and Assessment for the Northampton Public Schools. Thank you for your work to address the Chapter 70 issues. Um, this is the abridged version of the abridged version. Mm -hmm. One of the, uh, today I'll share my testimony specifically addressing how Chapter 70 reductions have affected the curriculum and instruction. One of the most significant changes that affect curriculum instruction in the elementary schools has been the loss of vice principals starting in 2003. This translates into little or no time for principal-directed curriculum and other instructional work with teachers. Our Carnegie Award-winning middle school, one of the best in the state, has seen many losses over the recent years. Daily team meetings used for planning, differentiated lessons to address the needs of all students have been reduced to two or three times a week. Three health teachers, a PE teacher, three exploratory teachers, three band periods per week. Full year sixth grade world language cut to 12 weeks. An entire team of teachers was eliminated. In 2009, JFK cut $20,000 from textbook supplies and it has never been reinstated. District reading services have been gravely affected by these cuts. In 1998, we had five reading teachers at JFK Middle School, and now we're down to two and a half, and we do not have a full-time reading specialist in every single elementary school. At the high school, we have seen teacher-student ratios significantly increase and teacher PE, PE teachers cut. Decreases in Chapter 60 funds have greatly affected our students' access to art. Music and art at the elementary school is a mere 30 minutes, two or three times a week. Elementary band was the first to go. We are fulfilling many of the needed curriculum work in schools. But however, because we have no associate superintendent or director of elementary education, as in most systems our size, my job includes more tasks than anyone could possibly fulfill, including analyzing a myriad of data in meaningful ways for teachers and with teachers. Essentially, Chapter 70 funding reductions have left Northampton with significant struggles at a time when the state's curricular standards are at the highest in the country. Being asked to cut as much as $215,000 from school budgets to endure the override process for months while teams of teachers <coughs> agonize over how their grade levels, teams, or departments will reorganize their teaching and instructional responsibilities over and over again does not promote high teacher morale and a sense of security and community nor does it inspire teachers to trust that their long-term work on curriculum will be worthwhile and enduring. We need, we need to do better. It is to the credit of our exemplary teachers, paraprofessionals, and principals that our students are making solid progress and find joy in meaning their academic lives in Northampton Public Schools. I implore the committee to consider the financial factors involved in offering in, um, in curriculum and instruction to meet the rigorous state standards and the differentiated instructional needs for an, a diverse student population. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Cheevers? See none. Thank you again for your testimony. Gwen Agna, also Northampton Public Schools. She's got a lot of ladies around. Okay, we let her uh, just go. Is this, are you Gwen? Yes. All right, just in time. <laughs> I will be brief. I'm a citizen of Northampton. My two daughters went through the Northampton Public Schools. I'm in my 19th year as a principal at the Jackson Street Elementary School in Northampton. 
I've been an educator in this district since 1988. I was among those who were excited and optimistic when the Education Reform Act was adopted in 1993. I welcome the establishment of the curriculum frameworks as well as systems for measuring student progress through a variety of means. I also supported the redistribution of educational funding so that districts whose communities could not afford to fund its public schools would be allocated more money through Chapter 70, leveling the playing field, as it were. Northampton is not the image portrayed in the media, nor is it what it is reflected in its downtown. We are an urban area, yes, a small urban area, but like big cities, we have big city issues of poverty, transiency, homelessness, mental health issues, and skyrocketing special ed and ELL costs. Unfortunately, since Northampton had met its obligation for its educational foundation budget in 1993, our, our district suffered from the allocation of the position of 36 out of 36 districts in its funding. We have continued to suffer from lack of funding as well as significant budget cutting every year. As a result of the over 20 years of this devastation, our schools, their services, and staffing are underfunded and struggling. In the elementary schools in Northampton, we have eliminated assistant principals, school counselors, librarians, elementary curriculum coordinators, and recess lunch assistants. We have felt the tremendous negative impact of a very lean central administration with the elimination of the associate superintendent and director of grants and curriculum. I'm not here to advocate for taking away funds from less resource districts. I'm here to ask that Northampton's allocation through Chapter 70 be significantly increased as the pot should be increased. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Excuse me. Um, about halfway through, you made a comment and threw in a comment about 36 out of 36 districts. I, uh, could you clarify the point that you were making? I, we can't uh, figure out what it was that you were getting at. Well, my understanding that when we were given an allocation and we are among cities, that our allocation was um, at the bottom of the 36 cities. 36 cities, thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry. Okay. Thank you for that question, David. I shared it. Um, any other questions? Thank you again for your testimony. Um, Jordan Abbott. Is Jordan still here? Okay, I'm going to move on. Uh, Stephanie Conrad, thank you. Afternoon. I'm Stephanie Conrad. I am a parent of a 15 and 11 year old in Orange, Massachusetts. I'm also the chair of the Orange Elementary School Committee. Um, Orange is a small town at the North Quabbin area where uh, Worcester and Franklin County come together. We are um, less than 8,000 as a population, but we do suffer from a lot of large city problems. Um, as many uh, mill towns along the Connecticut River, Millers River, and Deerfield River um, have uh, come to since manufacturing exodus um, many decades ago. We're a level three school. We are in the bottom 10% of all schools in uh, Massachusetts. And uh, while a lot of people brought up a lot of wonderful points about um, things that need to change, I guess I'll you know, share a personal narrative about our town. Um, we struggle financially. Uh, that came to a head in 2008, where um, I don't think it was malicious, but money was taken out of our budget to patch holes in our municipal uh, budget, um, which then dropped us below our net school spending number. Mm -hmm. We were penalized as a town, penalized as a school. Um, we finally gotten out of that hole um, and we're struggling still. Uh, we have a $9 million budget, $2 million comes from grants, 
leaves us seven million left to to pay for. Uh, chapter 70 actually pays for at least 90% of that appropriation to the elementary school. Our issue is with the town and their ability to pay that additional $2 million. Um, and a lot of that, as other people have brought up, it comes from insurance costs and um, insurance liabilities. Uh, Unfortunately, every time we come to the town to ask for increased funding, the argument is always made, well, what about elderly homeowners? What is this gonna mean for them? Unfortunately, it's created a toxic environment where we're trying to pit our elderly against our youngest population. And as a school committee and as a, a town, we struggle to try and, and create a balance. Um, I'm not sure what the solution is. I know um, last year uh, we've, I should backtrack, we've, we've implemented a zero-based budget for the last three years, which we found very helpful because we only ask for what we need. Unfortunately, um, while we increased from fiscal year 14 to 15, our pie in the sky number was 9%. Is my three minutes up already? Oh dear. Um, I think chapter 70 has to look at what local aid is given to the towns as well. I think that that goes hand in hand. While our chapter 70 money does adequately provide for what the schools need to give out in terms of expenses, our municipality is still falling short on their obligation. And, and I really do think that we, we can't compartmentalize those things and just say it's a Chapter 70 problem. I think it's an overall revenue and tax problem. So. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none. So thank you again for your okay. testimony. I wish your, I had more time. And your discipline. And please know, and please, for other folks in the audience to pass this along to others, the commission is accepting written testimony on a rolling basis. So anything that you didn't get to say today, you know, we would gladly accept in a written format. It doesn't have to be super formal. You, know, you can send an email uh, with anything that you feel like you didn't get to fully communicate today. Oh, don't worry, I will. Good. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Mary Ford. Am I right? I understand this. This should be Mayor Ford. Uh, yeah. Uh, sometimes I go by the no longer honorable. <laughs> um, but I am, anyhow. Uh, I started uh, my involvement with uh, schools and school budgets in Northampton, actually, on a committee of the League of Women Voters to study local education and state policies and programs. Uh, and I uh, was active when Proposition Two and a Half passed uh, to uh, defend public school budgets and was uh, convinced, as many people were, that one of the goals of Prop Two and a Half was to roll back school spending because school committees had been independent and able to levy taxes on their own. I don't know how many people here remember that. Um, in fact, in Northampton being half mill town and half college town, we routinely elected school committee members who voted to hold down the property taxes that would fund the public schools. So there was some progressive thought that the state would come in and adequately progressively fund public schools in this commonwealth. When the reform of 93 passed, uh, many of us thought now it's going to happen. The fact is, let me put on my taxpayer hat, local property taxes as a percentage of our municipal and school budget have gone up relative to the state proportion. Every single decades since then, two full decades, and I don't believe that there could be more than one or two of those years where that uh, trend uh, uh, varied. So I agree with the orange representative, particularly when you're looking at smaller communities. We are classed as a city, we have plus or minus 30,000 
people, and we have striven as a matter of public and community policy to not be a bedroom suburban community, to keep up our proportion of affordable housing well above what 40B requires, and to be fair to our middle income families who are living here often the third generation in the same household as their immigrant parents. Okay, we're about as diverse as you can find. And I was there in 93, it was the second year that I was mayor out of my total of four two-year terms. And at that time, when the foundation and the minimum requirements came down, it was pretty obvious that the goal of offering uh, aid from the state so that poor communities could provide a minimum was what was the main purpose of the formula. And then the formula got tweaked when places like Wellesley and, and uh, Weston said, wait, you don't want us to lower what we spend to get to that point. Quite appropriately, it was tweaked so that there would be efforts to hold harmless, as one gentleman said, the communities that had been using property taxes and could afford property taxes to have better school budgets. Northampton was right at the median of all the state's communities. We therefore kept exactly where our spending was. Okay, we at least thought that with the state's policies in place, we would be able over the years to shift a little bit of our property tax burden onto the more progressive taxes that the state has available. In fact, the opposite has happened. And you've heard the reasons, you've heard about health insurance and so on, but let me just say something quickly about efficiencies. I get really tired of hearing people based in eastern Massachusetts, inside 128, say that the schools aren't efficient enough. Nobody out here in the Pioneer Valley, the Connecticut River, the Berkshires, the Mill Towns, and the Hill Towns, you won't find a single school where the school committee members, as well as the mayors, haven't done their best to be cost effective. And that's why you heard a wonderful principal say the term in, in unions would be a speed up. She now has to do a job that used to be done by a principal and a vice principal. That's what we've done over these years. We no sooner in one year put somebody in the central office to work on coordinating the curriculum between fifth grade and middle school and the high school in things like English and math, then they get laid off the next year. We bring somebody on to try to get grants. They get laid off and we're told your, your school leaders have to uh, write for the grants. We have economized and economized. This is not efficiency. We did close the last of our neighborhood schools at a, uh, during the 90s. I, uh, I was known then as the mayor who cried on camera when that school <laughs> closed because that school was educating solid citizens who understood with only a couple hundred in a school, they knew their principal, the principal knew them, they understood their connection to a community. We did away with that. The elementary schools now have 500 kids and that was considered an efficiency. Uh, but I feel it's a loss. And I feel like because the principals know they have to have paraprofessionals in the classroom because the, school, the classrooms aren't small enough, then they have to give up their vice principal. Then you ask, how can the parents be more involved with schools to bring about the quality and the coordination that we all want where students are able to function in the school system, uh, and we don't have the capability of bringing that about. And other people have mentioned, you have a parent-teacher group, we have a Northampton Education Foundation that raises money to bring arts 
and school uh, field trips, indoor schools. That is a shame, if not a crime. The focus should be on what is the minimum foundation budget for adequate education across all demographics and all types of communities? And how is the Commonwealth, with their responsibility for public education, going to secure the revenues so that indeed all communities are held harmless, but no communities have to make these kind of hurtful sacrifices year after year after year for 20 years? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Ford. Any questions for the mayor? Seeing none, thank you again. We hear you loud and clear. Are you from Mass Municipal in your group? Yep. Yes, okay. not here today. Not here today. But yes, in our group generally. Um, Ruth Kennedy, I believe this is uh, Gateway Public School District also. Well, my name is Ruth Kennedy. Um, I'm a, um, a resident of Russell, Massachusetts. I'm also on the Gateway uh, School Committee. I'm also on the Subfinance Committee of the Gateway School Committee. Uh, we struggle. I've been on the school committee almost five years now. And every year, every year I've been on, it gets worse and worse. We're really struggling. Um, we have to meet the challenges for the children. They come first but we also represent our towns. So it's, it's, it's really hard. Um, for clarification, I have filed, because of the withdrawal of one of our towns, I have filed a lawsuit in the Superior Court in Northampton um, on the unconstitutionality of the withdrawal. Um, if this withdrawal goes through, we are really gonna be, the whole state's gonna be a detriment because I know there's other towns that want to get out of district, so it's, if this happens to us, it's going to happen to other towns. Um, there's a couple things. I've heard a lot about taxes, and we need taxes from you guys coming down to us. I, don't, I haven't heard anybody say that the taxes come from down here and go up there to come back down here again. Um, I'd like to hear more of that. I'd like to have more of our taxes stay at the local level so we can control it. Um, I don't think we need up on high to tell us how to educate our children. I believe our, our uh, towns, our school committees can do that quite well. Um, there is an old saying, um, or however you want to put it, it's called KISS. And it's keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> and I really believe that if you go back to, is that three minutes? Oh, <laughs> if you go back to um, before this 1993 thing went through, um, <clears throat> when we went back to a simpler time, our kids were educated quite well. They went on to college. They were able to do things. Our families were able to control what was going on in their own schools. Um, I'd like to see it go back to that. Um, I think less above, more below, and try to get through the fact that um, the taxes do come from us. Money doesn't grow on trees at the state or federal level. It has to come from somewhere, and it comes from us. Our, in our area, we don't have industry anymore. A lot of our land is in either trusts or the state has taken over, so they can't be they can't be taxed. Um, so I will write down my testimony to you. Um, I have more ideas, so thank you for listening. Thank you for coming out here because it's really hard to get people from your level out to our area. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Seeing none, we thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you for coming here. Thank you. 
Uh, the next person who has uh, signed up, I may, I'm sure I'm going to mispronounce this, uh, Phil Dowgaert from, uh, looks like Springfield. No, no longer here. Okay, we'll move on to Mary Clark. Mary Clark? No? Patty Cavanaugh? Okay. Sue Biggs? Joshua Wilcox? Thanks, Joshua. Uh, just for efficiency's sake, the next person on the list is, um, looks like Meg Robin, followed by Tracy Dawson Green, if you could be prepared to testify. How many more do we have? Three. <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> uh, my name is Joshua Wilcox. I'm a parent of a uh, kindergartner in, um, in Holyoke. He goes to the Sullivan School. Um, and initially, I just wanted to come and show my support, and essentially, uh, they're looking to have the school taken over and spend all the money taking over the school, where if the school just received the money directly, they could probably pull themselves out of it. Um, it's, it's kind of a sad school to, to see. Um, I was educated in the middle of the state in West Brookfield. Um, our elementary school was very bright, very airy. Um, it wasn't new, it was cinder blocks, but everything was, uh, it was clean, it was nice. There wasn't anything crumbling, um, as you'll see with this, with this school. Um, and it's in really bad shape physically and from the teachers as well. Everybody seems tired and um, just being here and hearing all the other other things said about improvements and uh, ways to do things, there's there's definitely some things that um, I'll submit in writing as far as the data and uh, how to best handle that from a state level um, and coordinate and actually give the schools an incentive to send their data up and have it handled at the state level. Um, I think that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. Yep. I just want to uh, thank the gentleman for coming, as well as all of the people who came, because oftentimes it's very, very difficult for an ordinary citizen to come, and they're not used to this, and we appreciate your input. It's been very, very good. Thank you all so much. Mm -hmm. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> and thank you. I'm Meg Robbins, and I live in Northampton, and I am a parent and a grandparent of uh, students who've attended Northampton schools, I've been a teacher all my life, and I've had the pleasure of being um, a coach in professional learning communities uh, throughout the state, and I've gotten inside lots of districts and lots of schools. I'm really, really happy that you guys are here because we never see this kind of setup out here, so it's fabulous, and we're very happy that you're here. I am curious, though, that um, on the prospectus here, there are rather what looks like um, a rather weighted cross-section of non voting members of private organizations who have historically lobbied powerfully on behalf of privately run charter schools that are publicly funded. And I do note that they're non-voting, but I think it's curious that the voices are there in assessing how much of um, Chapter 70 funding gets changed or assessed, because to me, that really is the key question that's in front of us, that there is a certain amount of money that's allocated to public education, and that what's really changed since 1993 is who it goes to. Um, I was a teacher in 1982 when Proposition Two and a Half came through, and I know that my children lost um, music and PE, but I also watched a whole generation of young teachers get pink slipped, and, and they never came back. They moved to Oregon and Washington. We didn't see them in the state. And I worry about the new teachers who come in and the new teachers who stay. I worry about the parents who send their kids to our public schools. And I worry about how we actually are defining the mandate that's in front of you. The first piece, which is um, that we are looking at educational programs and services necessary to achieve the Commonwealth's educational goals and to prepare students as achieving passing scores on the state's assessment. My biggest concern is that the unfunded mandates like MCAS and PARC, which are the single assessment of state and student success, um, are a huge strain on public, on, uh, on city and public funding. Um, that, 
that charter schools which receive guaranteed per pupil allocations of that public funding in our district, I don't think have actually testified in front of us today, and I wonder why, since they are in fact direct recipients of that money. It comes through us and it goes to them. And I wonder, actually, to keep it very short, um, you know, whether or not we're going to be looking at their claims for success as well. And I really wonder when our discussions as we go down through this criteria are really going to be about um, what we really mean by a democratic education, how our funds will be used, what's our definition of that. And I'm remembering as I taught history for many years that Harvey Wasserman wrote in his classic 70s history of the United States, which some of you might remember, um, that the Civil War made a few men very rich. A lot of those were actually in Springfield. They made buttons and uniforms. Um, but I wonder about the disparity between public and charter school accountability and sincerely hope that future historians will not be writing that charter schools made a few men very rich. Um, we would heard today that something that is most just is not often the thing that gets passed. And I wonder when publicly funded charter schools will be asked to provide testimony on efficiency, resourcefulness, and models of effectiveness. I thank you for your time and for your dedication for being out here. It makes a huge difference. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Um, seeing that, I, I just want to mention, um, for, for the sake of uh, the credibility of the work of this commission, which you know is important to me, I hope is important to you, that um, as I, I think what you might have been referring to, ma'am, was the members of the advisory committee that are listed. Uh, f for what it's worth, there's only one organization on this list that I could ever even close to recall hearing a, you know, a pro charter schools um, position from. There are many uh, members of this commission who represent organizations who are well on the record in opposition to charter schools in Massachusetts and charter school, the, the current charter school funding structure. So I just want to mention that in the name of balance. Uh, and that also, you know, the, whatever we end up with as a state for the Chapter 70 foundation budget calculation, it's actually a boat that charter schools and district schools are in together. Uh, it's a rarity in that sense, um, but both, both systems drive a lot, their funding through the Chapter 70 formula. So, I, you know, I just want to make sure that that's, that's clear and folks' understanding. Right. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear about that, but I would say that that is the most serious drain in terms of public finances on public schools, that they do go to privately funded charter schools. And that's, a, that's an ongoing issue that certainly I don't think was foreseen in 1993, except for a few in designing that particular piece of legislation. And although that's not within the scope of the commission, I, I, I will say for me it's, it's a message I'm hearing loud and clear from, from the um, respondents today. Uh, we have Tracy Dawson Green, and then the last person we have signed up, uh, I'm not sure if I'm reading this right, Blue Duval. Tracy Dawson Green had to leave. I'm hoping that you will allow me to take her place and speak instead. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to address the commission. I hope that. Uh, Sorry, ma'am, can you just state your name? It's coming. Okay. One, one sentence. <laughs> I just want to. I want to thank you, and I want to say that while what you're hearing are a lot of concerns and complaints, we are very grateful for funding we receive from the Commonwealth and for your time and effort in reviewing the formula. My name is Lisa Minnick. I am beginning my 25th year as a representative to the Northampton School Committee. In other words, I've served since before the inception of education reform and the founding. For, uh, the foundation funding formula, and I feel I have a valuable perspective. Uh, located in the scenic Connecticut River Valley, Northampton is a historic 360-year-old city with a vibrant modern downtown. It's a desirable place to live and work, and it boasts a diverse population and a range of opinions. But its age and location mean that Northampton has very firm geographical borders surrounded, as it is, by neighboring communities. There is no room for expansion, and most of the buildable land within the city has already been developed. We are proud to be home to Smith College and to one of the most respected educational collaboratives in the state, the Collaborative for Educational Services, where I am the chair of the board. And both of these entities, while valuable to our city, remove property from our tax rolls. 
With limited opportunity for new growth, Northampton has long subsisted on only the annual 2.5% increase in property tax revenues allowed by law. Nonetheless, we've been committed to providing quality education for our students. When ed reform was introduced, as has been pointed out by um, former speaker, the principal of Jackson Street School here in town, Northampton was doing a good enough job to just clear the bar on the foundation formula, and as a result, we received minimum level of state aid per student. Over the ensuing 20 years, we've continued to barely meet the foundation requirements, and we have continued to receive the minimum level of funding. For a number of years, Gwen threw out a statistic, 36 of 36. My statistic is, for a number of years, Northampton's level of state aid ranked 349th out of 352 districts in the Commonwealth. With expenses for maintenance and employee benefits rising and the need and desire to adequately and appropriately compensate our faculty and staff for their skills and talents, each year we find our costs for level services exceeding our projected income. And each year the school committee faces the distasteful process of deciding which budget cuts will be the least damaging to our programs. We've done our best to keep the cuts away from direct services to students, but in an enterprise in which about 85% of our expenses is personnel, it's hard to stem the trickle-down effect. We've repeatedly asked our city's residents to approve overrides to mitigate these budget cuts, and we continue to ask people to do more with less, but a reduction in our staff numbers has been the unfortunate result of this. Uh, several people listed the myriad things that have been lost in the city of Northampton over the 20 years that we're discussing. Um, and let me just say that in his testimony before you, Northampton superintendent has spoken to our district's critical need for funding to improve technology, and I would add that we need to re funds to replace curriculum materials and provide professional development for teachers. But to assist us in this funding, uh, in funding these expenditures, the superintendent has requested that you revise the foundation formula to better account for employee benefit spending and special education costs. As much as anything, I would ask that you look at the foundation formula and redesign it in such a way that it doesn't penalize districts like Northampton that are limited in their local revenue potential but still uh, working to meet the expectations for quality education. Right now, the formula rewards districts that perform poorly. I ask you instead to find a way to reward districts that are exercising good fiscal management and still providing challenging, relevant educational opportunities for all students. Thank you for your thoughtful attention. Thank you. Tom? Just a follow-up question. Yeah. <laughs> the, the very last comment about the formula rewarding mm. low performers. Could you explain what you mean by that? Uh, I should have used my air quotes when I said reward. <laughs> it, it, as the as uh, former mayor Mary Ford mentioned, the formula was designed to provide equity and to bring up the districts that were underperforming and that didn't have the finances. And it, originally, it seemed like a good idea, but it seems that those districts that were actually doing a good job and have tried to stay doing a good job continue to get the minimum amount. And so I'm just asking that there actually be an incentive for doing a good job instead of simply more money poured into a district if it's doing a bad job or if it has specific problems. So uh, I'm, I, you'll let me know if I don't cover what you're about to say, Tom, but I you know, appreciate the, the, um, the push for incentives uh, for, for good performance, which we certainly will take to heart. Um, I, I just, uh, I cannot let it stand uh, you know, that, um, you know, the Chapter 70 formula is designed to um, to achieve equity, as you've said, uh, and I think it's important that we, as a as a public and as policymakers at the local and state level, don't confuse um, poverty with poor, poor, poor performance. Uh, the Chapter 70 formula. I, I think the formula addresses. Yes, the formula addresses poverty. I think that where there are underperforming districts, it may be because they have poverty. It may be because there were. I, I think that there was money given to districts that had poor performance because of a variety of reasons, whether it was poverty, whether it was um, 
poor management. I don't know what it was, but originally many districts were given more money than they could actually spend. In the initial, I think you'd be hard. Pre- I think you'd be hard pressed to find a district that would that, that would attest that they have more money than they could spend. Not I now. If we not could, now, we but in the need. beginning, I think that was the case. And it just all I'm saying is I'm not saying take anything away from any of the other districts. I'm just asking that for the districts that have worked hard for 20 years and still get minimum aid, I'd love to see some kind of an, a, a reward for good behavior. Point taken. Point taken. And, and the only I, the only point I think that's important to have on the record is that it aid is not tied to performance. It's perf, it's tied to the this commission again. The scope is to define adequacy and whether it has appropriately kept up with change in demands and expectations and, and inflation and the like. But then once that standard is established for everyone, it's about fiscal capacity to meet the requirements to deliver that. So if, if the formula, let's say this commission does great work and the legislature follows this advice and establishes an appropriate measure of adequacy, where the formula would go from there and has gone from there in the past is to say, what is each community's fiscal capacity to meet that, the delivery of that? And that it distributes funds to make sure that it closes the gap between local fiscal capacity and get there. So it doesn't define how is a, how is a district Performing, how much do we need to get? Give them to get to that point. So that it's just a conceptual. I think you saw a reaction across the board because it's important that people understand that fundamental point that it does not look at student performance. It's an important. I think. I think my concern, however, is the that in at least in Northampton, we have gone to our citizens, our residents, many times for overrides, and they have always come through for us. But it has skewed the balance and such a huge percentage. We have no new growth on which to rely, which is what funds some of the bigger cities in the eastern part of the state. We don't have that. That was my point originally, is that we don't have that to rely on. All we have is our 2.5% increase annually. And we've asked our citizens on multiple occasions to pass overrides, and they've done it. But I don't know how long we can keep going with that kind of off balance sort of thing. I think that we need to figure out some way for the foundation formula to provide more than just minimal assistance to a community like Northampton. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for your testimony. Ms. Duvall? And just, I just want to, as you're coming forward, if there's anyone who believes that they signed up and has not been called or uh, feels a burning desire to testify, although we are late in the day, um, if you could please you know, come forward and, and just make yourself known. Good afternoon. My name is Blue Duvall, and I want to thank the esteemed members of the Foundation Budget Review Commission for their ongoing support of our public schools and for having this hearing here in Western Mass, because it is very difficult for a lot of people to get out. Um, I am a resident of Northampton. I went through Northampton High School, um, the elementary school, the, um, all the way through. My, I have children who are 26 and 24. They also went through Northampton Public Schools, starting at about third grade, which is when they came to me and I moved back to Northampton so that they could go specifically to Northampton Public Schools. So I moved all the way from the West Coast to come back here to educate them. I was shocked to see the losses, the losses, the, the changes in programs. When I went to school, we had a librarian in every school. We had a librarian. I was at my daughter's school when they took away the librarian. And two other school, elementary schools had taken him away before that. We had four elementary schools that had librarians, that had vice principals, that had more ESPs than they do now. And I'm a volunteer in the schools. And I see as the ESPs are now no longer taking one child here, they, they are splitting it. And it's very, very difficult. And it's difficult for the morale. I have five sisters, and one of my sisters went to what was called Fiker School, and at the time that was for the uh, special ed children. So I know and I've seen how special ed has has been funded, I mean, on a personal level, how my sister received the, the help that she did so that she ultimately graduated in a regular school, and this was back when they had different schools, a regular school at Northampton High School with everyone else. And I, and I it was because of the funding of the SPED program, because she had an awful lot of services and support. My daughter, who's 24 years old, um, she also had certain special needs. However, 
the budget here in Northampton cut off the criteria line somehow. I ended up having to pull her out of this school, taking her over to another public school, which had, um, which assessed and put her on an ESP program. Uh, I mean, I was, is it SPED? 504. 504 program. She went on a 504 program. Her grades went from way low grades up to A's within two years. It was just a matter of, of the special ed, and I, and I fought it, and they had teachers fighting it because she was somebody who didn't even really learn to read and write until she was like 10th grade, where, where the first time I saw something that said the, spelled T-H-E. Very, very smart, but she had a learning disorder. So I'm concerned about that. And also, when I went to school, we had academically talented programs. We had that as special education, because some of them are. Now we have what's called diversified teaching them to try to address all the different levels within the same classroom. So I'm just saying that there's a lot of different changes that have gone on. When I was in the middle school, we had, um, we had Talking about the budgets, we had athletic teams, we had after school sports, we had all sorts of, um, not sports, after school activities. I went to a science club and went away twice a year for the weekend with a teacher um, and a group. And it was, it was wonderful. We no longer have any of that. I took French when I was in fourth grade. I took languages. Mr. Volf, I can just, I just want to mm -hmm. let you know you've hit your three minutes. Okay. You can, you know, I'll back. hurry it up. Okay, thank you. But I had languages, I had French, both offered in the elementary school. My older kids had. Um, no, no languages, but they had the instrument offered. I have a 12-year-old daughter now who's at JFK. She just started in seventh grade. The cuts are just affecting everybody across the board. So I'd like to say, you know, thank you very much for coming. But I do think that if you could get by and tell people that we want our mandates, the unfunded mandates, mandated, then and paid for, that would be wonderful. And the other thing that I have to say is transportation, public education is supposed to be free. Well, it was free, it used to be free, but now because of the budgets, we no longer have it free. So depending upon where you live in the school district, some parents don't actually have a free public education because they have to pay anywhere from $300, $600, $900, depending on how many kids they have, to get their kids to school. So that's the other thing I wanted to say. Um, I think that's all I have to say other than the fact that since that all happened, I became a school committee member, and I'm a school committee member at Northampton High. I'm in Northampton um, School Committee now, and I have been for four years, and it's hor horrific to sit there and have to cut program after program and teacher after teacher. And the only other thing I wanted to say is my son was, uh, was he had to drop out of Northampton High School because he couldn't function in 30 to 35 kids in a class. So even if the funding is for special ed and this, if it's not all of it taken into consideration, then somebody else suffers. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Before you go, let me just check for questions. Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, did you wish to testify? Our grand finale. Yes. My name is Darlene McVeigh, and I live in the town of Huntington and we're part of the Gateway Regional District. I wasn't going to testify today, but I saw a few looks on some of the committee members when um, Mohawk and Frontier Regional were talking about keeping their, their local schools. And yes, sometimes that doesn't make common sense to keep them open, but they're, they're working very hard to keep those schools open. Um, in 2010, uh, whether I agree with it or not, our school committee and administration embraced um, austerity, and they closed three schools. As a result of closing those three schools, we now have to pay a penalty back to the MSBA of $327,000 a year. Our school committee did what they thought was right, but because those schools were closed before the loans were paid, we pay a penalty of $327,000 a year that could be going to fund education for our children. Our school choice has increased so significantly that we have an outgoing deficit of $750,000 we're talking a school district of less than a thousand children. And because of school choice, because of closing several of our local schools, parents have choiced out and continue to choice out. 
and they're concerned because we've, we also have lost a town within our district because they were very dissatisfied with the fact that our school committee did close three schools. In fact, the legislature is the body that has allowed the town of Worthington to leave our regional school district. We lost our autonomy. The legislative process allowed Worthington to leave through a home rule petition. We are now, quite frankly, fighting for our lives. We were told at the beginning of the year that we were $350,000 in the hole because we had to start up an additional preschool program. Outgoing school choice had it increased so significantly and there were additional transportation costs. We were also told in an October meeting that it's now going to cost our local communities an additional $200,000 to fix our water wells. So if you take 350,000, 200,000, that's 550,000. And before the 9C cuts that now are going to impact us by another 241,000, we're almost $800,000 in the hole. And let's acknowledge the fact that Worthington will be leaving next year which will cause another $650,000. I implore you, our communities did what they thought was right. They felt it was responsible to both the taxpayers and to the school districts in closing these schools. But you enter into this, it's a quandary. You can't make people happy and it becomes a very vicious cycle. And now it's so vicious that as a chair of the finance committee of the town of Huntington, I have too many sleepless nights wondering how we're going to pay for it. We have two towns in our district that are approaching bankruptcy. Two towns in our district where the tax rate is over $22 a thousand. When you hit 25, guess what, folks? You're filing bankruptcy. We've lost our industry. The town of Russell, Strathmore Paper, Westfield River, um, Bendix in Chester. We have lost all of that industry in the last 20 years. We did what was right, or at least our school committee did what they thought was right. And, and how were we rewarded for our efficiencies? Did our reimbursements go up? I don't think so. I would ask this committee to think about it because our, our community, our regional school district did what they thought was right and we are now in a crisis situation. And a lot of it was not of our making. Thank you. Ms. McVeigh, before you leave, I don't uh, talk I actually discussion. just want to thank you for your testimony. I, it, it, to me, it's a uh, very appropriate way to end the hearing. It just, you captured some of the challenges, the complexity of the challenges, and the way they interact. It, it um, I just appreciate your testimony. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Uh, on that note, thank you, everyone. Uh, you've stuck it out uh, for the extra hours, and we really appreciate your turnout here on a Saturday afternoon. And um, please do what you can to spread the word to others that you know that we are accepting input, uh, again, over the next few months on a rolling basis. So